All right, welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and this is Matt. We are here with Dr. Dino to continue dismantling the so-called evidence for evolution. Are you related to a sea sponge, a banana plant, and a fish? Today, we continue answering that important question for you. Kent, how you doing tonight, brother? Oh, I'm I think good. you might be on. You're good. I'm good. Okay. I tell people God is good, but some of God's kids drive me nuts, brother. But God's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's great to have you, Kent. Matt, how are you tonight? You excited? Yep. Excited for this one. Doing good, though. Ready? Yeah, we've got another comprehensive show demolishing evolution, that kind of evolution that says all life, including plants and animals, are related through common ancestry. If by evolution you mean change over time, we don't disagree with that, right, Kent? Right, but the changes have limits, you know. Right. You get bigger cows and smaller cows, and but you're never going to get anything other than a cow. That's right. And so before we get into our uh, main topics here for tonight, we're going to continue debunking Vice Rhino, a prominent evolutionist on YouTube. I did want to ask you, Kent, looks like you just had your debate number 355. So our, our goal is, is to get you to 500. I'm curious, how did that debate go? What were some of the highlights? I thought it was great. It was a guy named Aiden Linden who believes in uh, the Big Bang. And we, he wanted to talk about cosmology. I said, well, I'm, I'm in favor of cosmology, the study of the universe. I'm great. I love it. Okay, I taught our science 15 years. We studied the stars, the galaxies. I love that. But they want to include the Big Bang as part of cosmology. No, the Big Bang is a religion. You have to believe. Time, space, matter came from nothing. You have to believe they, all the energy was contained in this little dot. It's a religious belief. It's not part of cosmology. Big Bang is nothing but a religion. And he said, well, the, we didn't really, uh, the, the stars aren't really getting further away. The space between them is expanding. I said, man, I'm going to use that if I get pulled over for speeding. Officer, I wasn't even moving. That's just the space between me and them. my house was expanding. That's all. I wasn't moving at all. <laughs> he said, if you put two dots on a balloon and then blow up the balloon, the balloons don't, no, what do you say? They don't get further apart. The dots stay in the same place. I said, so if they're an inch apart on my balloon, I blow it up and now they're three inches apart. They're not farther apart. Are they farther from the center? Because I blew the balloon up. It's such a dumb, dumb theory. The whole cosmos. The whole Big Bang Theory is so stupid. I don't know how anybody with two functioning brain cells can believe something that idiotic. But they do. I don't, I don't care that they believe it. That's fine. Believe whatever you want. But they want to force everybody to teach that, to pay to teach that to all the kids. That's where the problem comes in. Evolution is a religion. Nothing scientific about it. Are we on air okay? Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's great. It, it's that they call it science. They want to put it in a science textbook. It belongs in, in the garbage can, Kent, as you've pointed out before. And it's so a, it's a religion. Just admit it's a religion. That's all it is. So when it comes to the Big Bang, Kent, in order to get to biological evolution, which is what we're talking about, they essentially have to bypass cosmic evolution, which is what you're debate comprised planetary stellar how do they explain let's say planetary and stellar evolution yeah how did the planets form how did the stars form they really have no answer for that they believe the dust from the big bang got together and made a star well wait a minute if you had your big bang all the particles are getting further away the every second you wait they get further away how are they going to get back together Gravity decreases with distance. It's the inverse square law. So how did this dot, this all these particles flying off of your Big Bang ever get back together to make stars and planets? They don't have an answer for that. Well, it just must have happened because here we are. Oh, it's just so dumb, so dumb. I feel sorry for them. <clears throat> in, in your opinion, what are some good lines of evidence against the Big Bang being scientific? Well, science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. I think that's a universally accepted definition of science. Can we observe it? No. Can we demonstrate it? No. Can we do it again? Make another big bang. And they have no answer for where did time come from? Where did space come from? The big bang banged into what? Where was space for it to bang into? 
Was space already there? What about time? Was time already there? They say 13.772 billion years ago there was a big bang. Okay, well, what was here 13.8 billion years ago? And 13.9 and 14 and 14.1. Is time eternal? They don't have an answer for that. And where did all this energy come from? All the total energy of all the stars had to be in that dot. That's one hot dot. <laughs> and I've, I've, heard you, I've heard you speak, Cap, <clears throat> to the first and second laws of thermodynamics that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Second law, everything's winding down, the law of increasing entropy. So if everything's winding down, if we were to wind it back up, and yet the first law says matter and energy can't be created nor destroyed. Doesn't that mean that matter and energy would have had to come into existence from an outside force being God? Well, yeah, to, to, to the Christian, it's easy. God created the heaven and the earth. But see, we admit ours is a religion. I believe God did it. I have no way to prove that. I believe it. They will not admit theirs is a religion. They want everybody to teach it like it's part of science. And it's not part of science. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Science, a knowledge gained from observations and experiments. Nobody's observed a Big Bang. Nobody's observed nothing, create everything. But they teach it like it's some kind of science. I'll show you here. Here's what they're teaching. They want all of us to teach the kids in school. Here we go. Time, space, and matter all began with the Big Bang. In a fraction of a second, the universe grew from smaller than a single atom to bigger than a galaxy. A, that's not science. B, that's stupid. Stupid. Tell them I said so, okay? I'll debate them all on that. <laughs> well, we, we may have some of the critics in our live chat. So if you got objections, Good. challenges, criticisms, please do make sure you're tagging me. And Ken, we're going to be having you back here very shortly for another one of our uh, two-in-one debate events, round three with another skeptical guy, what is the evidence for evolution, which... We are going to be continue, uh, continuing to engage tonight. So let's get right into it. Kent, our last show on this topic, going back a few weeks ago, we focused on the so-called lines of evidence for evolution, common descent from Vice Rhino. He's got a playlist here. He's done us a favor. <laughs> He's put all the most famous icons of evolution, lines of evidence for evolution for us to engage. So we got through the first three, homology, embryology, and vestigial structures. Evidence number four that he has listed here, he has a video on it as well, evidence for evolution from geology. Matt, I'm going to hand it to you. Can you briefly set the foundation for this topic of geology? Why do those that hold to an old earth and common descent believe geology supports their viewpoint. Sure. Well, I pulled up the definition and we can see it right here. And I believe that it's built into the definition itself. That's what they've done. It says here, geologic layers are sedimentary layers or beds that are ordered sequentially with the oldest at the bottom and the youngest at the top. This is based on the principle of superposition which states that the oldest rocks are found on the bottom because that is where they were deposited first. Then the next definition I found was here. Most people think that evolution is related to biology and paleontology. What they don't realize is that most paleontologists are geologists who use fossils to date the rocks and study past environments. This was Darwin's theory of evolution is the structure that supports these efforts. So, right there is in a nutshell pretty much why they believe it because they admitted right here that it's the ordering must be true based on the youngest at the top and oldest at the bottom and that uh, uh most people they they're using the fossils to date these rocks so right. lo and behold, those are the evolutionary views so we're going to do that uh and talk about those definitions and take away the assumptions based behind it. And they have to assume that Steno's law of superposition there is a correct assumption, that it's accurate. And so I appreciate that, Matt. Kent, let's hand it over to you, brother. What are your thoughts on geology as evidence for common descent? Well, I taught earth science 15 years. I love this study. Hey, Bobby, can you get the uh, sand art toys up there? Let's put them both over there. Um, 
The idea that the layers are different ages is absolutely stupid. They keep saying the top layer is younger. And I keep asking them, where did it come from? How can it be younger? Is it coming from outer space? All the layers are the same age. If you watch the video, uh, Experiments in Stratification, done years ago in Colorado by some French guy with a name this big, he shows clearly that the layers form sideways, and you get five, six, ten, ten layers forming simultaneously sideways. If I flip this sand art toy over and it makes 10 or 15 layers of sand, uh, are the layers different ages? No, they're all in here at the same time. There is no such thing as a geologic column. It doesn't exist. This law, law of superposition is stupid. It's not a law at all. If you get 10 layers forming simultaneously with a sideways current, which you would get with every tidal pump during the Noah's flood, <clears throat> the earth is spinning under the moon, which is lifting up the water, making the high tide. So the water is constantly being sucked into the, to the dent, to the gravitational uh, bump. Earth is spinning, holding the bump of water is the moon. Earth, water is always being sucked into that tidal bump. At the same speed, the earth is turning the other way. Well, at the North Pole, it's turning zero, but at the equator, it's turning 1,037.6, depending on your altitude. And so the water going sideways at 1,000 miles an hour would make 10 or 15 or 20 layers at the same time. Just watch experiments in stratification. The geologic column does not exist anywhere in the world. It's fiction. But they date the layers by the types of fossils they contain. It's non-existent. It doesn't exist. There's no geologic column. It was made up. Charles Lyell, a British lawyer who hated God and hated the Bible, and a good friend of Charles Darwin, he, he started this whole idea with the principles of geology. James Hutton also was involved in this, trying to make it look like the layers are different ages. The Bible says at the end of time, there would be scoffers who would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. The flood of Noah formed all the layers. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting all the layers. Dead trees only stand around a couple of years. Each layer that we see is a different tide, not a different millions of years. It's baloney. So let's see. He wanted to free the science from, ge from the Bible. He wanted to get geology away from the biblical view. He wanted to, to teach evolution. I say, guys, the layers can't be different ages. If they are, where's the material coming from? Outer space. They've got the uh, pr protozoic era as 2.5 billion years old. And the Holocene at the top at only 10,000. Where was all that dirt sitting for 2.4999 billion years? Huh? They don't get it. They just don't. I, I don't know how they can't see it. There's no such thing as a geologic column. If you shake up a jar with water, sand, clay, it'll separate into layers in seconds. Are the layers different ages? Uh, no. They're all, the same. They're all in the jar at the same time. And we flipped this thing over and made, wow, we probably 40 layers in a matter of minutes. Are the layers different ages? No. So the geologic column does not exist. How can the layer be younger on top? Is it coming from outer space? So the geologic column, does it exist? No. Now there are certain layers like sandstone, limestone, shale, etc., that are in certain orders a few places in the world. So what? It's all sedimentary rock, and they all they date it with the fossils they contain. It's clear circular reasoning. I cover that in here. You go right here. <clears throat> circular reasoning. Let me get up to the slides here. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as their work brings results. Hey, it works, so we're going to use it. It cannot be denied they're arguing in a circle, circular reasoning. The succession of organisms, that'd be the evolution, is determined by a study of their remains in the rocks. And the relative age of the rocks is determined by the remains of the organisms. Encyclopedia Britannica. They knew that 55 years ago. Ever since William Smith, at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating uh, and correlating the rocks. Apart from very modern examples, which are really archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. Radiometric dating would not even have been feasible if they hadn't erected the geologic column first. There is no geologic column. Niles Eldridge, a famous evolutionist, said, there's no way to simply look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. Hmm. This poses something of a problem. If we date the rocks by the fossils, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of change 
through of evolutionary change through time. Well, good point. You can't. The rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. Circularity is inherent. We have to use it. The charge of circular reasoning can be ignored. None of your business how we do it. Or it can be denied. Oh, we don't do it that way. Yeah, you do. Or it can be admitted. Or it can be avoided. Let's change the topics. But it's circular reasoning. There is no geologic column. I stand by my guns. <clears throat> I think we have all the evidence we need. When you see a tree petrified in the standing position, running through all the layers, it's not logical to say the layers are different in age by millions of years. Maybe by one year during Noah's flood, as the tide goes up and down, every tide will change six hours, 12 and a half minutes. The water rushes in, rushes out, rushes in, rushes out. It made all these layers in one year. There's no geologic column. Doesn't exist. Anyway, go ahead. <clears throat> and polystrate trees can are a fantastic line of evidence for the Genesis flood and also against deep time evolution. We just had Ian Juby, who's done a lot of study into yeah. this topic on the channel for an open mic debate allowed the critics to join and their uh, responses, their, their objections, I, I think, did not answer this main problem or challenge of poly straight trees. Can you speak to that a little bit more and, and why it's so important in terms of the origins debate? Well, the, the, the whole evolution religion is based on this stupid geologic column. It doesn't exist. A friend of mine works at a coal mine up in Birmingham. He said, man, we got petrified trees standing up running through seams of coal all the time. I think I got pictures of it here. Here it is sitting on top of a seam of coal, a petrified tree, which still has the bark on it. The trees were buried rapidly <clears throat> in Noah's flood. They might have taken 40 or 50 years to petrify, depending on the pressure and the types of minerals, etc. But it wouldn't matter. Once they're buried in the mud and protected from oxygen, they're going to very slowly be replaced by minerals, called a replacement fossil, petrification. So burial took place in, in minutes. Uh, petrification might have taken place over 50 years, but they've got two seams of coal they're digging out up here in Birmingham. They've got the Blue Creek Formation and then the Mary Lee Formation. Who, who named them? I don't know. I don't care. Okay. But they have petrified trees, A, B, C, D. He said, Brother Hovind, we can prove to you tree H, uh, letter number H on here on the left, goes through the Mary Lee Formation, right through it. And uh, letter tree A goes through the Blue Creek, but they also both go through this layer in the middle. Well, that means both those seams of coal had to be formed before, before a tree could rot. But yet they'll tell you a forest has to grow, then it has to be compressed and squeezed under a lot of dirt and turned to coal. By the way, they can make coal in 20 minutes in the laboratory, okay, under heat and pressure. Take a piece of wood, heat and pressure, turn it to coal in 20 minutes. And then they'll say millions of years of strata appeared over the top, and then a whole new forest had to grow. And then it got pressed into coal. Well, there are 27 forest layers, layers of forest at Specimen Ridge and Yellowstone. Most of them have broken off roots, but some of the roots extend through all the different layers. They didn't, the tree didn't grow there. Noah's flood would have ripped them out. They float around for a while and get redeposited. Of course, they're going to float root end down. That's, that part's heavier. So they might float around in the wild and get redeposited. Just because <clears throat> the Bible teaches Noah was in the ark for a year. That does not mean the whole world is covered for a year. Parts of it might have only been covered for five minutes. I already ate, honey. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That's what everybody needs, a wife like that to bring you ice cream. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think parts of the world might have been covered for a few weeks. The crust of the earth was broken up like an eggshell, and it, it still is today. And I think the plates of the earth, the plates as big as Texas, would be flexing up and down, moving around, jostling back and forth. And it might have been underwater for a while. Hey, Bobby, get me that thing up here, that blue that little, that's uh, got a white lid. Okay. <clears throat> if the earth is covered in water and it tilts or moves a little bit, the water is going to rush to fill in the low place. Thank you, ma'am. That's a little demonstration here. If, I, if part of the earth lifts up, the water goes down to this end and this becomes out of the ground. Then it might tilt back. Oh, now this is underground. You can get the water moving back and forth with the tide or just with the crust of the earth being busted up. So I think the flood is by far the best explanation of all the layers that we see and all the fossils that we find. There's a 30-foot petrified tree in the Kettles coal mine in Cookville, Tennessee. The top and bottom are in different seams of coal. Same tree. I'm telling you, all the layers formed in one year. Noah's flood. 
But the Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant of that flood. Second Peter chapter three. Okay, and you had Ian Juby, praise God, tell him to give me a call. I want to have him on my program. He done great research on the polystrata fossils up there in Joggins, Nova Scotia. Ian Juby, there it is, ianjuby.org. Yeah. The pit, the trees, they didn't rot. The bark is still on many of them. They were buried in way less, less, less than one year. All those layers formed. Okay. <clears throat> Very good, Kat. So what you'll oftentimes hear from those that believe in, in common descent and the geologic column is represented in the textbooks, they'll say, well, sediments are broken away from these pre-existing rocks through different means, weathering, for example. And so they're eroded, moved from one spot to another location. And this is where you get the new layers from. Is that a sufficient answer to your challenge? Where do the, uh, new layers come from, Kent? Well, I'm constantly pointing out moving it from here to here does not change the age of it. I've got a coffee cup made in the last two years, Dr. Kent, the science gent, made out of clay. Mm -hmm. We know it was made in the last two years. Here is a fossil fish. I'm going to put the fish on top of the coffee cup. That proves this fossil is less than two years old. That's the logic they're using. <laughs> I moved it on top, therefore it's younger now. <clears throat> Tell them I said that's real dumb. Okay. <laughs> you know, we've talked about with you these experiments in stratification. We've also had uh, John Mackay, he's a geologist, young earth creationist in Australia, and they've done these flume experiments where they see these layers form rapidly in these strata machines, even limestone, essentially right. showing that no, it doesn't take millions to billions of years to form these layers. You can do it instantly, especially during a worldwide flood. Well, Noah's flood is the best explanation for all the layers. And the fact that we have fossils at all is indication mm. <clears throat> they were buried rapidly. How many animals died in the last five years in the world? A lot. Colonel Sanders killed a bunch of them himself, didn't he? Okay. How many of them turned to fossils? None. Nobody's seen a fossil forming that I'm aware of in ever. We see fossils in the ground, a bunch of them. I think Noah's flood provides the perfect conditions to make fossils. Rapid burial in soft mud, can't get oxygen, so it's going to slowly let the, as the cell decomposes, the minerals soak in and harden, and the fossils form in Noah's flood, all one year. I have somewhere on my desk here, a pet, here it is, a petrified clam in the closed position. Petrified closed. They find these things on top of Mount Everest. I think it had to be buried alive, because clams open as soon as they die. This is indication of rapid burial. Now, it might have taken, again, 50 years to turn to stone. Doesn't matter. It's buried and dead in minutes. Okay? That's good. Kent, we've got um, one of our skeptics in the chat, Ken Rock. He's asking okay. you how, he says, ask Kent, how not only would the trees survive the massive increase in pressure of that much water being on top of them, but how would anything survive that amount of pressure? Well, Ken, how much how much was on top of them? Do you know? Were you there? Did you see this? They might have been buried just 10 feet deep. They were still protected from oxygen. <clears throat> and again, it might take 50 years to fossilize. You don't know how much pressure was on them. I know they can make coal in the laboratory in 20 minutes. It's been done. So I think it's crazy to say the we, we know the Earth is millions of years old because of fossils or because of petrified wood. The fact is, that it can form quickly and it's been demonstrated okay and isn't it true we find fossils we have examples of uh fossils of fish being eaten fish giving birth does it take millions of years to give birth Kent? obviously they would have had to been buried rapidly right <clears throat> there are fossils of fish uh here we go let's see no. fossils of fish eating other fish uh the fossils of they find fossils of creatures with other fish, uh, other animals still in their stomach, undigested. So they were buried rapidly. It's just, but they're ignorant of the flood. They're willingly ignorant. They're finding fossils is no problem. There's trillions and trillions of fossils. If you want to count the diatom diatoms individually, there's probably quadrillions of fossils in the world. Whole school of fish fossilized in the swimming position. Whole school of fish buried. I would say Noah's flood could do that. Just the tide going up and down is going to suck the water in and out at the same speed the earth is turning. It could make a layer of mud 50 feet thick in 10 seconds. Here at Lenox, Alabama, 31 degrees north of the equator, 
We're turning 886 miles an hour right here, right now, toward the east, which means the water is rushing into that bump at 886 miles an hour for a couple hours. Then it's calm for a few hours, and the sand and clay settle out. Then the water goes rushing out of the bump the other way. So I think <clears throat> they've done studies and said if the earth were covered in water, if the earth were smooth, not flat, if the earth were smooth and covered in water, earth would be 8,800 feet or a mile and a half of water over the whole earth. Well, then the tide could become harmonic, and the tide would go up and down 200 feet. Now it averages about six foot tidal change. Bay of Fundy is greater in a place like that, Anchorage. But average about five foot tidal change. Well, if you had a 200 foot tidal change, water rushing in and out of that bump is going to form all these layers and fossils in hours, not millions of years. Fossilized, I got the picture you're talking about here somewhere. Fossilized fish and the swimming, all swim in the same way too. Oh, they got buried. Uh, here's a fossil fish with his mouth wide open. Fossils formed from Noah's flood. They did not form millions of years ago. Where's the one? The fossil beds. Uh, I've got all these pictures in my, get my seminar series, brother. Tell your people, it's 18 hours for 50 bucks. It's all about all this kind of stuff. How to prove the earth is not old. Uh, where dinosaurs fit into the Bible, they fit right in perfectly. The Garden of Eden, what was that like? Why did they live to be 900 years old? Lies in the textbooks. Video number five, the dangers of evolution. That's the one they came and got me and put me in prison for. <clears throat> anyway, go ahead. Great points, Kent. You'll also hear defenders of common descent and the geologic column those that argue it's reality they'll say well you got volcanic ash or lava that can essentially build up or accumulate over these buried organisms and then eventually those layers will harden into rock and the layers will build up over time so what are your thoughts on that answer to your challenge of where do new layers come from kent does that answer the challenge well they're still moving it from here to there same right. age I tell them, look, every speck of dirt in the universe is the same age, whether it's 6,000 or 6 trillion. Every speck of dirt's the same age. Moving it from here to here does not change the age of it. And these layers, so they say the animals are sorted based on, first of all, they're not neatly sorted like they would like. But they say, well, clams are found at the bottom, yeah, and, feather, and birds are found at the top. Generally, that's true. What does that prove? Clams are already at the bottom when the flood starts. That's where they live. Of course, they're the first ones buried. Birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. They fly around until they run out of gas, and then they get, they fight. when they do get, finally die, they float. They have hollow feathers, hollow bones. Of course, they're on top. So I think that there, if there's any sorting at all, and it's not a, a neat, nice, neat, like they'd have you believe, they're sorted based upon their habitat, where they live, sorted based on their mobility. Clams can't run very fast. Based upon their intelligence, clams aren't too bright, and based upon their body density. Logical, logical answer for why there's any sorting at all. Right. When you actually dig into the ground, young earth creationist geologists like John Mackay have pointed out, you find mixed environments. It's not reflecting what we see in the textbook. Deep sea, shallow sea, land dwelling, all mixed together. Not this neat order as the evolutionists want us to believe. A lot of times they'll ask, Ken, I'm curious what's a good answer. They'll say, why don't we find whales? in the deeper layers with sharks and fish, whales being mammals, we essentially find on the higher layers is somewhere, I guess the conventional model would say 50 million years worth of time is where you find the whale. So if they're in the, the water, the ocean, how can we don't find them in deeper layers? What's a good response to that, Ken? Well, first of all, you notice they, they will always say, like the, the debate I just did with Aiden, why do we find, who's the we? <laughs> I, I didn't find it. Okay. Did you find it? And if you find something that goes against the geologic column, it won't be published. Right. It can't because it can't be true. They've got 10 or 15 different ready-made pat excuses for why it's in the wrong position. Oh, there was an overthrust or there was an earthquake and it cracked open and it fell down. They got a hundred different reasons why it's not the way they want it to be. They will defend their stupid geologic column with religious fervor. I mean, this is their Bible, brother. You know, people don't understand how important this is to them. This geologic column is their Bible. They think in terms of, oh, back in the Cenozoic and back in the Mesozoic, and there's no such thing as a Cenozoic. It's baloney. So why do we find, now as far as, why, why don't we find uh, whales and sharks together? Uh, sharks and whales are still living together today. What does that prove? You know, they've never found fossil human and fossil chicken footprints in the same rock strata. That proves right. humans and chickens did not live at the same time. 
<laughs> Doesn't it? That's I had their chicken for dinner last night. Logic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I appreciate it. So, okay, here, here's a question that comes in from someone in the chat. Scriptures and stones. Does Kent think that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers of today are not the same ones before the flood? The biblical text seems to indicate they are. I don't think there's any possible way to know the answer to that. I think when Noah and his kids got off the ark, they saw the rivers and probably totally different, brand new, and said, oh, let's reuse that name. This, there was a Tigris River and Euphrates River mentioned before the flood, and now we have one over there now. There's no proof that that's the same river. There's no way to know that. I think they just reused the name. I mean, right. when they came from, when they, when they sailed from York, England, landed over here, guess what they called it? New York. <laughs> they re, reused the name. <laughs> well, the whole re real estate has been changed since the pre flood to the post flood world. Everything's different. Yeah, everything. Yep. We found out where the Garden of Eden is, though. Lenox, Alabama. <laughs> well, we're all heading over there then, Kat. You're going to okay. be busy. Matt, any questions or anything you wanted to add on this topic before we move on to our next piece of evidence here, brother? Um, Ken seems to know a lot about the history of uh, how this whole thing came about. And wasn't Darwin mostly influenced by Charles Lyell, who was making this up kind of as he went along? Charles Lyell was a lawyer who hated God, okay? He strongly influenced Charles Darwin, who wasn't too smart. Darwin was an average student. His t teacher thought he was kind of dull. And Darwin just plagiarized a bunch of other people's stuff, okay? But yeah, he was strongly influenced by Lyell. And uh, they kept looking for evidence. He had this theory, wow, maybe we all have a common ancestor. Where's the evidence? They couldn't find any. So Lyell made up some about the gill slits on the embryo, which is not true. He lied. There are no gill slits in the embryo. So, yeah, it was it was quite a big deal back in the mid-1800s to try to discredit the Bible. That's really what their goal was. I got it in here somewhere. But anyway, yeah, they, they, they helped each other. Uh, embryo, gill slits, it was Charles Lyell <clears throat> and others who made up with this, made up this dumb idea, and Ernst Haeckel. They're all involved in this, making up evidence for this dumb religion that we all came from a rock. That's not true. Hope, dream, and imagine. That's what it requires to be an evolutionist, Cap. Yep. So you'll also hear, and you've heard it in your many debates, the critics will say, well, the absolute age of all the atoms in the universe are the same, but relatively, if, if we were to take the atoms of me and you, well, absolutely they're the same age, but we're still different in age. So that's how they would look to some of the structures in the geologic column and say, sure, the atoms are the same age, but these specific rocks were formed earlier. I'm curious what a good response <clears throat> is to that. So if I cut down a tree and cut it up into lumber and build a house and I carbon date the wood in the house, am I going to get the date that the house was built by carbon dating it or the date that the tree was cut down or the date that the tree grew? Maybe it grew for a hundred years before we cut it down. Which one's going to, what's a carbon date going to give? Which mm -hmm. one? they're still missing the whole point entirely. We don't know the age of every speck of dirt is the same age. Moving it here to here or combining it with something else, did that now change the age? Right. If I dig up iron ore out of the ground, melt it down, take the iron, shape it into a car, what year do they put on the car? Hmm. Yeah, 2024, if it's, an, if it's a new no, car. They should put the age of the iron. They should put it, you know, 4.6 oh, right. yeah. years old. <laughs> But it's only got 10 miles on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're really missing the challenge. They're missing the point of the challenge. And it's a good challenge that, that you've put out there, Kent, on the geologic column. What's the best way to respond when some of them, they'll say, well, you don't really find the geologic column anywhere in the world. But there's these uh, few localized areas on the planet where, where you find most of the layers in, in their entirety. Well, they they should be everywhere, first of all, but they find a few areas where they're in the in the layers in the order that they want them to be. Mm -hmm. They want there to they, they're like how do you tell if a, if a layer of rock is Jurassic? How would you possibly tell? There, there's limestone found in every one of these eras. There is a, a paleo, Paleocene limestone. 
Miocene limestone, Cretaceous limestone, Jurassic limestone, Triassic limestone. How do you tell the difference between Triassic limestone and uh, Jurassic limestone? By the fossils. Well, how do you know the age of the fossils? By the layers. It's pure circular reasoning. It's real dumb, real dumb. Right. And well, hey, look at the bottom here. At the bottom, we have trilobites in the Cambrian. The trilobite is the index fossil for Cambrian rock. There's all kinds of different trilobites, hundreds of different kinds of trilobites. Three means three lobe, trilobe, three lobe, tri, meaning three. The first appearance of trilobites in the fossil record is 50, 521 million years ago. The, uh, this, the trilobite has the most complex eye ever found. Here's a fossil trilobite right here. The trilobite has the most complicated eye ever found in the nature. The eyeballs are incredible. Some of them are huge, big as a, big as a uh, umbrella. But how do you get the first animal to evolve have the most complex eye? The evolution of sight. Yeah, sight started off with just a light sensitive spot and slowly evolved into an eyeball. This is stupid. The trilobite can have as many as, let's see, I think it's 1,300, uh, thousands of lenses, all wired straight to the brain. This one has 15,000 lenses. That eye is the first one to evolve? Guys, they're insane to believe such a thing. There might be some trilobites still alive. There's certainly a lot of creatures very similar to that, okay? But quite not quite a trilobite, but close. Here we go, the isopods, right? Sure. Uh, first trilobites. So, the, but if you, how do you know, how would they tell the, if I handed this trilobite fossil to any geologist in the world who believes in evolution, I would say, how old is this fossil? He would immediately say, oh, that's from the Cambrian. How do you know? Well, it's a trilobite. What about this rock around it? Is that Cambrian? Yeah, it has to be Cambrian, it has to be. What's the difference between Cambrian limestone and uh, uh, Holocene limestone? Well, the fossils. They date the rock by the fossils and the fossils by the rock. Circular. Tell them, tell them I said it's real stupid. Tell them sweetly and smile about it. Okay. <laughs> and it's funny, even when they point to some of these localized areas where they think they find the you know so-called 10 periods of, of the geologic column, they won't point out that the thickness of these layers, it's a very small percentage of what the textbook represents the geologic column as. So really, they're not showing you anything that uh, fits what we see or what they portray in, in the geologic column in the textbooks anywhere on the planet, as you've pointed out. I think that's a solid point. Yeah, that's their Bible. They really believe it. Yay, great. Believe whatever you want, but admit it's a religion and get it out of the public schools. Very good. Teach it in a Christian in a non-Christian school. Start a, start an atheist school. Teach them whatever you want to teach them, but I don't want to pay for it. Very thorough response to number four geology. So we've we've gone through homology, embryology, vestigial structures, and geology. So the next one we have here, a popular one, one of the the favorites of the evolutionary community, dating methods. So before we have Dr. Dino respond to dating methods as evidence for uh, common descent or evolution, Matt, can you briefly explain why the evolutionary community views dating methods as good evidence? And make sure to unmute before you start talking, brother. Awesome. Thanks. Um, sure. Radiometric dating is one of the favorite dating methods used because of the half-life that we witness uh, here we go. Hopefully there we go. So what happens is there's a decay rate that comes from uranium and it comes from a lot of different radioactive elements, but uranium is one of the older elements. So they believe that when they look over and we find a stable element like lead, that how much lead is there? Well, if there's this much lead, then what must have happened is it has, must have decayed from the different decay chains, probably coming from uranium or thorium, and decayed and created all of the lead that we see. So therefore, the assumption behind this is there's this much lead, and it must have decayed from that much uranium, which took this much amount of time to do it, which originally was debated around like 2.2 billion years was the first um, uh, calculation. And now it's increased, as you know, now we're into the billions. So that's the overall theme of how radiometric dating works and why it's used as such good evidence for deep time. Okay, I appreciate that, Matt. Kent, over to you, brother. Well, what's a good response to dating methods? Go ahead. 
Well, all these radiometric dating methods were made up in the last 70 years, okay? Way before that, they were already teaching the age of the fossils. They'd already decided how old this was way before they even heard of radiometric dating. 1950s, Willard Libby, University of Chicago, come up with carbon-14 dating. All of the dating methods suffer from fundamentally flawed assumptions. I tell them, look, if you walk into a room and you find a candle burning on the table, and I ask you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know. It was burning when I got here. Okay. Well, let's do some empirical science. Let's measure how tall the candle is. We can do that. We measure the candle and find out it's seven inches tall. Nobody argues. We all agree it's 7.0002 inches tall or whatever. Now, when was it lit? Well, that won't tell me. Okay. Let's measure how fast it burns. We can do that with an Olympic stopwatch. Let's say it's burning an inch an hour. We all agree it's burning an inch an hour and it's seven inches tall. My question remains, when was it lit? You can't tell me, you just ran out of science, and now you have to use assumptions. How tall was it? Don't know. Has it always burned at the same rate? Don't know. When you dig up a fossil and it happens to contain some uranium and lead, you can tell exactly how much uranium and lead are in that material. I don't question that. And you can tell how fast it's decaying today. You don't know how fast it was decaying a thousand years ago. Okay? You don't know the decay rate has always been the same. So you can't know how much was in it when it started. I mean, lead's a pretty useful product. Maybe God made some lead when the world was created. Did all the lead come from uranium decay? We don't know that. Lead's pretty useful as is, necessary for some of the biological functions. So I think the, uh, the, fo the fossils, when they, when they date them or date the layers around them to try to bracket the age of the fossil, they're, they're, they're making some obvious assumptions. How much was in it when it started? Uh, has it always decayed at the same rate? We know there are things like the solar flares that are influence radiometric decay down here. Pressure can do it, air pressure. Um, and so a lot of people have done, uh, icr.org has great articles about the problems with radiometric dating. You certainly can't know that it's never been contaminated. I think there's just, it's silly to say, all the radiometric dating methods, whether it's potassium argon, rubidium strontium, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 238, they all follow into the same trap. How much was in it when it died or when it started? And has it always decayed at the same rate? You couldn't possibly prove either of those. So I think it's silly to believe in the, those, prove the, earth, prove the Bible's wrong. But I got another program. I got to do my own here. So I just got a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, um, we, we can complete our time together on dating methods. And so I guess my follow-up question to that would be, Kent, when it comes to your assumptions with dating methods, the um, accelerated decay, would you as a creationist argue that at some point, maybe during creation or the flood, that the rate was sped up since an assumption is that it's always decayed at the same rate? I don't know. Any, I don't have any way to know such a thing. I know that God could have created it with some of each of the elements involved already in the material. Right. Yeah, and it would make sense of uh, if scientists were to come to rocks right after cre uh, creation, you could find uranium atoms, lead atoms, and although they were just created, scientists would use their dating methods and conclude those are billions of years old, even though they were just created, right? How old, how old was Adam when, it, when God made him? Just uh, Zero. brand new, brand spanking new. Now, to us, a zero-year-old looks like a little baby, okay? But to Adam, he was probably the perfect age, you know, 71. He thought, man, this is great. Uh, next year, it'll be 72, okay? Yeah, exactly. So it's not like Adam was created as a zygote or a baby in right. the garden. He probably looked like a 30-year-old a, a man. Oh, God, and man. judging by height and weight, scientists would conclude he's old. But if they were to look at blood tests... DNA analysis, they might be forced to conclude, well, he's young. He's got no evidence of age. So it'd be a, a mix. Would you say it'd be a mix of, of evidence with Adam, Kent? Well, it has to be that way. It wouldn't work for God to make a sperm and an egg and say, I hope you find each other. And if you do, then where are you going to grow? Uh, right. Who are you going to marry when you do grow up? I mean, God had it had to be a full-grown, mature creation. The trees already had fruit on them. Adam needed to eat the first day. So it has to be a mature creation. It's not going to work any other way. Right. Very good. Okay. Uh, well, Kent, okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we, I think we've done a good job 
now in our uh, two programs here, we've gone through the first five. We'll do uh, a third program on it and focus on the fossil record and phylogenetics. And so before Matt and I move into our next phase of today's show, Kent, did you have any final words on anything that we've uh, discussed so far in, in our first hour of today's program? Well, I, I'm not trying to sell anything because my policy has always been you can buy my videos, 50 bucks for the whole series, watch it, copy it, send it back, get your money back. OK, it's always been my policy. I learned right away when I started doing this ministry, creating videotapes and DVDs. Christians don't steal, but they borrow and never return. So, no, you cannot borrow it. You buy it for 50 bucks. If you return it, you get your 50 bucks back minus the shipping cost if we have to ship it to you. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would like to my, I cover so many things, 18 hours of teaching on the different topics about creation. And we've put these out in 42 languages. You can check drdino.com, my website, D-R-D-I-N-O. We're on a whole bunch of programs. What's the name of the new TV channel we have now? Kent Hoven, Creation Scientist. And they get that by going to cross.tv? Cross.tv or Lightcast Media. So new TV show, whatever that means. I've not seen it myself. I guess it's good, though, huh? Ah. So thank you for joining us, brother. Okay, brother, my pleasure. I look forward to a, a follow-up video on this topic. And you've been busy today. You've engaged in a debate on cosmic evolution and you've helped us dismantle more evidence for common descent. So Kent, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs> you've earned it, but all right, Matt, let me throw it over to you, brother, as I get some stuff ready for the quest for Noah, which we are premiering tomorrow, and I'm pumped for, I'm excited. To the audience, I have, Centurion, appreciate it. I have put together a comprehensive presentation, absolutely demolishing whale evolution. And so in the next phase of today's show, Matt and I are going to take audience questions. We're gonna uh, promote the quest for Noah that we've been working on for a couple months now. And we are also going to take audience questions. So please, if you do have some, uh, some questions, some objections, some challenges, uh, send those in. So Matt, we ended there with dating methods. And I get a lot of questions. We both get a lot of questions coming in through email. And lately I've, I've had several questions come in on dating methods. I'll typically forward those ones to you. And so did you have anything you wanted to add on the topic of dating methods as evidence for deep time and also evolution? Absolutely, I would. So I made this chart a little while ago. And what this chart shows is the atomic mass of the different radioactive elements. At the top, you can find argon and potassium. I'm sorry, uh, argon, yeah, potassium. And then lower underneath, at the very, very bottom, you find the more dense, heavier ones, which would be uranium and thorium. So therefore, if we were to look inside of rocks, inside of different things, I said that we would be finding the older ones in general, more deeper because they weigh more. So when they settled during the flood and get trapped into rocks, we would find them deeper. Critics laughed at this. They said, oh, that's nonsense. That's just, that's so primitive way of thinking. That's just ridiculous. Yet, what have we found recently? Exactly that. And it actually goes back to page 414 of radioisotopes in the age of the earth. Every single one of these showed that exact same concept being done in these different rocks. And more recently, we can find in another study that was just done called How Often Do Radioisotopes Agree? Or um, We can read it right here. We also found a systemic pattern of radioisotope discordances, somewhat similar to the pattern identifying previously by the rate team. Rate also reported that within A to B decay methods, uh, the heavier isotopes tended to yield older ages. In our study, we found the same pattern. So when we looked at this, we found the lighter elements were more at the top and they dated younger and the deeper ones dated older and directly in that same pattern. The color of each data point represent the atomic weight of each parent isotope given by the thing. So exactly what I was mentioning and exactly why we would find something like we would in the fossil record showing that it's, it doesn't have to do uh, with when these rocks were deposited. 
it, it determines how they would have formed during a flood. And there would be all kinds, they would be all over the place. This is just one of the general themes that we do see when we're looking at the fossil record. And it lines up with what I, actually I was saying. So we also found that when we looked at Mount St. Helens, we found using potassium and argon methods that the rock samples gave about 350,000 years. Then when we looked at another sample of rock, those rocks retained radioactive elements that were dated to 900,000 years. Then we tested another type of a rock and those radioactive elements trapped in that rock gave anywhere between one to 2.8 billion years. So when did Mount St. Helens actually explode? 1980. So the samples were just 10 years old, but they were giving all these anomalous dates based on what was tested. So that should make everybody pause for concern as well. But we're going to get into that. Also, what was also not expected by the evolutionary model was the disproportionate distribution of these radioactive element and these isotopes around the world. We find massive anomalies, mostly in Australia, with most of the concentrations being there and most actually on the crust of the earth, not deep within the core where everyone was actually expecting uranium to be found. They found little to none. That's right. Uranium was not at the core. So actually most was being on the crust with 53% of all radioactive elements actually in Australia. That's right. Over 50% of them are in Australia alone. And 90% of uranium and thorium are actually concentrated in the continental crust. That's on the top layers of the earth, which is why the flood would affect them in such a way that it would affect their distribution. So let's step back there now. And remember, radioactive series, the decay rate shows that... Uh, what happens when you're going to look at some of the earlier elements that would have formed on Earth? At creation week, we would place zircon crystals forming, and they're going to trap in it the environment that exists around them at that time. So it's very important that we know what those actually are and what they might look like, because it's not trapping lead, right? It's not trapping certain things. So what's going on? How could there be lead in there, but not from the decay of just uranium alone? We're going to get into that. We're going to actually answer that now. First, we have to ask ourselves, out of all of the different assumptions that go into radiometric dating, what is the most important? To me, it's the initial quantity. And that's what we're going to look at right now. And when we go to this study right here at Mount Clair State University, it was the first time they had used cold fusion to test and create radioactive or elements in general. And the first thing you'll notice is that the iron elements formed at the exact same ratio as they're at on earth today. Now, this is extremely fascinating to me because that got me thinking, wait a minute, if we're forming in a laboratory, the proportions that they are today, where what would happen if we were to form radioactive elements? Would they form as they are today or would they form as they were billions of years ago? Because that's pretty much what we would expect to see if evolution was true. So when we looked at the Proton-21 laboratories in Ukraine, they were working on that very, very thing. And they were creating radioactive elements because they were uh, focusing on making medical equipment uh, that uses fast rate radioactive elements, specifically tectinium-99, uh, what is it, uh, lutetinium-177, iodine-131, and they were using these for uh, practical applications, and they were selling them to, for medical experiments. So again, we're going to say, uh, what else did they make? Well, there we go. This is what was created in the laboratory in front of their very eyes. You'll notice that the natural ratio is in blue, and then the ratio after forming at an experiment is actually in the yellow. So the ratios are the same everywhere except for the daughter elements are the ones that are have a fast rate of decay. So if the fast rates of decay are forming at higher proportions, then this would make logical sense as to why we would have so much more lead, radiogenic lead than can be accounted for, which is an actual paradox. It's known as the lead paradox, by the way. It's right there. But it also explains why we have so much more lead trapped in zircon crystals that doesn't just come from the decay of uranium-235 and 239, but actually from the daughter isotopes that formed in very high ratio proportions and rapidly decayed into the lead. So when we're looking at the ratios of potassium, it shows the exact same things. It shows that the proportions and the ratios that exist on Earth today are what formed. But because these half-lifes are so old, we had to have something better. And that is where this comes in. This is where we're going to be looking at aluminum 
isotopes when they form. And as you can see right here, they formed in massive amounts. And this is what would be expected to form, the natural amount, very, very low and expected formation right here. But instead, it was the exact opposite of what they would expect. And it formed in the proportions that we see again today. How could that be possible if the Earth is billions of years old? Because the ratios right here, we see that the half-life is 717,000 years. That means that even if the Earth was 1 million years old, we would get a disproportionate ratio, but we don't. We see exactly how it is today. So when we're looking at these, oh, I was, uh, I had hoped that was a video. I was going to show you how zircon crystals can form rapidly and how they can trap the radioactive elements around them, but I digress. So this explains when when God created the heavens and the earth in the first couple days when the when the planet was formed, the natural environment was being trapped in these zircon crystals. And the natural environment was that these radioactive elements were formed in the proportions that we see them today, but more so in the experiment because these half-lifes are rapidly decaying within um, hours, weeks, minutes, months, really, really quickly. But their half-life parent isotope of that same element takes a very long time. So we can best explain that from our model uh, based on what we see. And because that's what science is, testable, observable, repeatable, that's exactly what they were doing in the Proton 21 laboratories in Ukraine until the war broke out. And now they no longer do this at all because they're in a war-torn country. So there goes the end of those experiments for who knows how long. So evolution predicted in the very beginning that the atmosphere contained almost no oxygen whatsoever. And that was the general theme because for abiogenesis to work, you need to get rid of oxygen because oxygen oxidizes things. It destroys them. It kills them. So the Mueller-Urey experiment got rid of the oxygen so that it could work with the natural atmosphere having no oxygen to destroy any proteins that might form. However, what does the new evidence actually show trapped inside of the zircon crystals? Well, guess what? Earth was less hellish than the textbooks describe. And if we read their wording, check out exactly what it says. Things were actually looking a lot more like modern day world in some respects early on. There was water, potentially a stable crust. It's not completely out of the question that there would have been a habitable world and life of some kind. Then we can read down here in the yellow yet again, a stoutly solid temperature meteorite clear and watery world in Eden from the very beginning. What does that remind you of? You can read this in Wired Magazine, where I found it again as well. So we're finding that exactly what we would expect to find if the biblical creation model was true, that the ancient world was completely habitable. God said he'd created it out of water and in water, and the, the earth is just water everywhere. Uh, it wasn't this uh, hellish environment, right, where the earth was just being created from bombardment of meteors, which can actually take us up into other predictions that were made, right? The earth was supposedly created and formed from meteor bombardment billions of years, right? That's that's how it formed. So this is a picture of what it would probably have looked like if you were to go back in time somehow and survive. <laughs> but the observational data this says the otherwise. So let's just take this one out. How about meteors and their origins? Page 270 says, the lack of fossil record of true meteors is puzzling. What does he mean by that? What could be going on here? Well, we're going to notice again right here. The It's meteorite clear, and that's not supposed to be the case. What's going on? How come there's supposed to be meteors everywhere in the fossil record? What do we actually see? Well, there's 71 impacts in 600 million years, or we can explain the 71 impacts in 6,000 years, which makes more logical sense what we find. There's a maximum of somewhere maybe near 190 fossil meteor uh, impacts in the entire geologic column around the world, maximum, but yet they want us to believe that the Earth was formed by them and were bombarded by meteors constantly through eons of time, yet there's no evidence for that. I mean, I'll just let you guys make that. And then they say, well, the earth was molten in the beginning. Well, when you melt granite, it becomes rhyolite and it can't ever go back to being granite again. And when we look at the basement rock, it's granite. So obviously the world was never heated to the point where it was molten ever. It was literally created wonderful and uh, right from the very beginning. 
Um, we can go into other predictions, like was there a supercontinent, like the Bible was describing, or was the Earth naturally formed as it is right now in other continents? Well, that goes to Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, who was a young Earth creationist that took the Bible itself and said, let's go off of what Scripture says, and we're going to say, hey, the continents probably moved into where they are today. That's right. Biblical creationist prediction that the continents would probably break up and that they drifted into where they are now. And you can read this directly from the magazine and the book itself. So before modern day plate tectonics, the scientific community firmly believed that the continents and oceans to be permanently fixed is a feature on Earth. So again, biblical young Earth creationists came along using this Bible itself, making that prediction. So the study proves, once we go back here again, we go back to the early era and we look at zircon crystals. What does it say? The study provides evidence for a non-mobile lithosphere. Lithosphere. That means it wasn't moving. There was no plate tectonic action. The stagnant lid of tectonic activity globally all the way back to a different era. Now, remember, we don't talk about these eras as in time frames. We're talking about them as different segments of things over time, as in uh, like during the flood. That's how we usually point to these. And we make predictions on that as well, by the way, which we'll get into right now. So the seafloor is spreading, moving very, very slowly, about three to six inches a year, right? So obviously it's old because that's how long it took to get there. That's what we're seeing, right? That goes back to observable, testable, repeatable evidence, right? So how could we say it was different? Because we're catastrophist and we make predictions and we can actually answer this now. So going back in Tim Clary's book, Carved in stone, geological evidence of a worldwide flood, he predicted that the sea floor spreading would show signs of a slowing down in the rock layers that were that we, young earth creationists, interpret to having occurred during the late receding phase of the flood, which correlates to the end of the Tejas mega sequence about 45,000 years ago. This predict our uh, predictions were made on what rocks layers would show the different rates of movement. And in 2020, the results from Brown University of California, Santa Barbara, examined the spreading of diff 18 different rates of the ocean ridges to confirm these predictions. And we're going to look at them right now. So what this is, is this is looks at, this is a map created of the Tejas mega sequence. You're looking at the uh, continent and the blue is the water. So they came along and they did, uh, ooh, that's a horrible picture. <laughs> Ground penetrating radar, basically. They're looking at the ocean floor and they start testing to see where is that? Where can we see movement? And is it fast or is it slow? And it was quite shocking. The evolutionists themselves said the seafloor spreading has slowed down 35% globally. Slowed down? I thought it was always moving at the same speed. Oh, that's right. It wasn't. It actually confirms our predictions based on what we would expect to find during these sequences and how fast they would actually move. It's exactly what we predicted. These ages correlated to the end of the Tejas mega sequence, exactly what he predicted in the catastrophic plate tectonics, which is interpreted to have the occurred during the late receding phase of the flood approximately 4,500 years ago. In this unrelated and earlier study, conventional scientists found that the subduction rate of the uh, uh, Borneo stopped at the same time. So if we're gonna say that it sped up, what about the dates that they give? very important to know, like, wait a minute, if it's sped up and it's moving rapidly over one year, how come it's giving millions of years? That's the most important question. So when we look at this ocean lithosphere, when you're looking at the earth, you can see the colors at the very bottom. The youngest dates are at the mid-Atlantic ridge where the lava is coming out. And then you'll find as it moves from the mid-Atlantic ridge, they start to date in the hundreds of millions of years. And then you can see kind of the greenish and some of the little bit of blue in certain areas where that's the oldest. So why are they doing that? The main reason why is because when lava flows go into water, the more they move down, the more pressure and the more cold they change the dates. This is in peer-reviewed published studies, by the way. We can see right here at the bottom, the ages calculated from these measurements increased with an sample depth up to 22 million years for lavas deduced to be recent. So as the lava was coming out and going down, and we can read right here, both the hydro uh, hydrostatic pressure from the water around it and the cooling, the temperature of the ocean, as the lava flowed down, it was extrapolating the ages and they were moving up in age billions of years I'm sorry, millions of years, even though it had just come out. See how important this is? 
This is why they can't use things to date very good. This is why when we looked at Mount St. Helens, uh, it gave such anomalous rates. It's because the the law that what they're using to date is affected by the atmosphere itself. So if you're if you're at the Mid Atlantic Ridge and the lava is coming out and it's flowing down, it's giving you a false date. And they admit right here, you can read at the bottom. Caution is urged when applying dates from deep sea ocean basalt in the study of ocean floor spreading. You certainly can't trust them when you know that the lava is coming out and you're testing it and it's only gone down maybe, I don't know, 500 feet and it's already <laughs> given you 22 million years of age. Clearly not true when we know how fast the lava is coming out and we can watch it go down. <laughs> so when observation is telling you one thing and the results are telling you something else, you have to go with the observation. That is what is awesome about our model. We are looking at the observational things and we don't have to make stories. We don't have to assume anything. We just say, look, this is what we're seeing. So it's unfortunate that uh, uh, radioactive elements themselves have been assumed to be old because of the assumptions based on lead, but that that's the best they could do. So I don't fault evolutionists for believing in deep time by any means. I mean, it's the most logical conclusion. You look in a zircon crystal, it can't absorb lead there's lead in there and the only way it can get there is from uranium then it makes sense that obviously a lot of time have needed to pass but that was based on the simplistic view that we had never seen any of these radioactive elements form in the past and now we do and when we look at them they form with all of these other daughter isotopes that are rapidly decaying creating all of this lead in very short amount of time. So now we can actually show you that the earth can't even be more than 1 million years old. So clearly it can't be billions of years old. And there's a things, these things are, uh, there's a limit to all these things. Just look at what these scientists are saying about the radiometric dates. As in the case with radiometric ages determined from almost any rock, it is, Im is impossible to establish unequivocally. Unfortunately, such checks, persistent problems, have pointed to a generally loomy picture for the radiometric dating tool. Contrary to the impressions that were given, radiometric dates do not prove the Earth is millions of years old. The vast ages are simply assumed. Then we get the final one. We're building a new generation of fairy uh, tales, or fairy, uh, fairy castles, and myths for the next generation to play with. Why is that? Because... Overall, there's a general perception and a competition to get an older date, and there's kudos in it. Remember, you get published for these things. You get put in a newspaper. You you find something new you're, that you're in a newspaper right away. So there, that's what they mean by there's kudos in it. You you get something out of this. There's always a reason behind it. So when they go, well, there's seafloor spreading, and then if we match it over here to some ice cores, and then if we match it to some radiometric dating, we can get a whole uniformitarianism concept out of that. And <laughs> that's the funny thing is they're, they're twisting the data to match one another, and, and that's what's unique. So what we need to do is say, are there anything that literally put limits to this? So sure, we might be able to find things that show that it's old, but what can we show you that it put a limit on that age? Well, argon and helium are two of those things that we can directly see. Why is there zircon crystals with, with so much helium and so much uh, argon in the potassium? It's because uh, uh, biblical young earth creationists in the catastrophic plate tectonics, they had to invoke, it must got, have gotten there from accelerated nuclear decay. We don't have to invoke that anymore simply because of what we witnessed as they form. They would have produced vast amounts of it rapidly being trapped in the zircon crystal. We don't need accelerated nuclear decay. And then there's other things. We have diamonds that have carbon-14 in them, which are uncontaminated. We have uncontaminated dinosaur fossils with carbon-14, oil, and coal. Why are those in there? Those shouldn't be there. And we can see right here, the potassium-argon method works on the assumption that the clock begins to tick at the moment the rock hardens. That is, it assumes that no argon, argon derived from radioactive decay was present initially. But after the lava cooled and solidified, the argon from radioactivity decay was unable to escape and started to accumulate. The problem is that argon is present even in recent flows that do not are and not due to radiometric decay processes. Therefore, it is well known that if radiometric dates contradict fossil-derived evolutionary ages, the date is discarded. 
So we have a lot of things that can put a limit to the deep time and age. And now we can add radiometric dating and, a, and other factors that are the, probably the most important aspect of deep time as well into that. And that's just part of it. Look, we can look at the rapid subduction that took place during Noah's flood that caused a runaway subduction and brought the upper cold crust down to Earth's core. And Earth's core is so hot that there is no way that that should be there over billions of years. There's no possible way. Here's a picture from NASA showing an enormous amounts of cold slab rocks down by Earth's core. Here's another one that shows there's a correlation by the low temperature and the red, which is very high temperature, which is a difference of about 3,000 degrees. So there is no way you can have deep time and have that evidence at exactly the same time. So as young Earth creationists, we that was actually predicted by uh, Baumgartner, I believe, predicted that one. Uh, beforehand, uh, obviously, predictions are all that really matter, right? How accurate are your predictions? Biblical young earth creationists are dominating with predictions, mostly in genetics from what I can tell. But outside of that, our flood model is very good as well. So uh, what else? Uh, that's too, too much to read. Sorry. We're not going to go over all of this because we can still cover a lot more things. Remember, this all goes back to Charles Lyell, everyone. And his goal was to free the sciences of Moses. He's the one that influenced Darwin. And he's the one that went to Niagara Falls and drew up this picture and went there and said, hmm, I'm going to talk to a local geologist and figure out how far back this water has been receding by the speed. So he sat down and he asked a local geologist, how far do you think the rate of um, breaking down is going for this, this waterway? How, how far back are we able to, to push this? He said, eh, there's probably an erosion rate of about three feet. So Charles Lyell went back and he documented one foot. The reason why is he was able to push the age of the earth back to 35,000 years. He didn't write why. He, he, he figured out that it was one foot a year of erosion and the geologist said three. He never stated why. He just lied outright and said it's, it's one foot per year. That way he could trick everybody and nobody would ever be able to fact check him because he didn't actually do anything. He didn't do any science. He didn't do any math. He just made it up and lied to the public and they believed it. So what ended up happening later? Well, they ran the numbers and actually found out it wasn't three feet. It was more. It was actually five feet a year, which drastically changes everything. So not only was he lying in the wrong direction, he was completely wrong because he got it completely wrong. His goal was to push everything back. And actually what we ended up figuring out was actually it was younger than before. So unfortunately, what that did is Charles Darwin brought that book of Principles of Geology with him the book of lies that he made up and even called his own history. And it influenced his way of thinking uh, deep time wise, which is unfortunate because when we type in how did geology influence Charles Darwin, we could tell it highly influenced him. Darwin's geology was also important in the development of his theories of evolution, teaching him important lessons of gradualism, taxonomy, classification, compartmental, uh, comparative anatomy, and uh, acquainting him with the finer details of the fossil record. So yes, it was a massive influence on everything he thought and wrote down. So don't believe for a second it didn't have an influence on him. So uh, we're going to look here real quick at, um, the, you'll notice what's a lack of burrowing. This is a, uh, here, actually, we'll open this one first. It's called bioturbation. And what it is, is when living organisms like snakes or worms burrow into the ground, Anytime there's uh, an environment like you walk outside your house right now, you're going to find evidence of bioturbation because there's living organisms. But when we're looking at rock layers and um, different, they don't show what you would expect to find of life existing in there, kind of like what is written right here. Life is impossible without soil la layers. And we know from the fossil record that abundant populations of animals, plants, and burrowing animals existed throughout much of Earth's history. However, there is an absence of recognizable soil layers and bioturbation anywhere in the geologic record. Oh, gee, I wonder why that is. Probably because it's not true. I don't know. Basic logic. Then you find things running through multiple layers of ge uh, geologic layers. Here's a, a leaf going through annual varves. Wait, how could that be possible? That's, how about um, fossilized uh, uh, lightning strikes called fulgurites? They should be everywhere in the geologic layer. Lightning didn't stop hitting Earth, did it? 
Well, apparently it did for billions of years because we only find it on the surface layer. Isn't that a surprise? And um, here we go, Coconino Sandstone. Throughout the Grand Canyon, the Hermit Shale and the large cracks up to seven meters deep right here, crack, you can see it going through all those layers that were filled with sandstone. Um, uh, how could large cracks avoid being filled for millions of years and then, uh, then be filled with pure Coconino Sandstone? See what they're getting at? How could these be millions of years old, but yet that crack not be filled in during that time period? And then Coconino sandstone layer came in over millions of years and then slowly filled that crack. You can't have it both ways, guys. It's obvious. Now we're going to look at the most obvious thing of all. If there was a global flood, you would think things would be trying to survive this. They wouldn't just stand there like a retard looking around as the water slowly burying them. They would try to get away because that's what an animal would do. And that's why we always find animal tracks before we actually find the creature that made them. And this is down the line in the geologic layers. And this is so blatantly obvious that Occam's razor has to be applied. It has to. It's the, it's the simplest answer is usually the correct one. You can convolute it with evolutionary nonsense all you want, but now you're going to get carried away. In science, the authority of a thousand opinions is not worth as much as one tiny speck of reason of a single individual. So when you hear people go, oh, well, you know, the vast majority of people believe this, it's you're just playing with consensus. You know, that doesn't prove anything because the majority believe it. Matter of fact, a couple thousand years ago, everyone would have just been a flat earther, right? That was the general consensus. So who cares what the majority says? Think, use your brain. We see trilobite fossils going through millions of years of geologic time before we even find the, the fossil itself. We find dinosaur fossils stuck in layers that, that are unrelated to each other. We find dinosaurs dying in, the, in this, in this uh, uh, position where they're struggling to grasp, grasp for air because they're being buried by water. Um, the rocks are missing. Where, where in the Grand Canyon, what the erosion just disappeared with that little tiny river pushed it out? Well, go look at the delta. Where are the trillions of metric tons of rock that should be there over all that vast amount of time? They're just missing. They're just not there. Uh, I guess just time eats things as well, right? I just didn't know that. So geologists are now think, oh, the Grand Canyon grew quick in spurts from massive flooding. See how close they're getting? 750,000 years. They're getting closer. Now it's a, a flood did it, but now it's a long time ago that it happened. So they're getting closer. Pretty soon they'll, they'll actually be right. But right now they're getting closer. They have to see this. I mean, it's, it's so obvious. So if you guys want more pictures of the um, things going through different, different geological rock layers, uh, go to uh, Creation Research, which is John Mackay and Joe Hubbard. These are websites. You can find the uh, both of those pages have all kinds of evidence of the the varves going through with different uh, layers because they're they're strata machine. They can show you how they form, and they have pictures from uh, uh, rocks that they collect in their collection. And um, uh, I guess one more thing, real quick, uh, we can look over here. This was a map that was uh, showing the data that was taken from core samples at fifty seven different locations globally around the world, and where uh, they started uh, to align them. Uh, using an algorithm, and the sites were well distributed in latitude, longitude, and in depth. So, right, they got them from everywhere in the world, in the Atlantic and Pacific, included two sites in the Indian Ocean, and they took 38,229 individual uh, samples, and all of the deepest uh, oceanic, oceanic volume temperature results came back the same from seven independent. So, what did they actually notice going back in time? They found a stable, this is going as deep as they could, everything was stable, and then there was instability going on. It literally looks identical to what we would expect in a pre-flood world. There's no random tons of ice ages. Temperature was stable from the very beginning, and then all of a sudden, temperature fluctuated rapidly and, ch and stayed changed from that time on. Exactly what we would expect to see in the biblical model. It's just shocking how much everything just matches. So it all goes back to the mindset. And um, when we look at what, what, who pushes evolution, why is it like really taught everywhere? Well, it's protected by law. It's pushed here, as you can see. It's uh, National Geographic is one of the biggest ones. It's, it's owned and partnered with 73% ownership of 21st Century Fox. So it's, an, it's owned by a news organization. Lo and behold, um, uh, we find that the mindset that comes from it's pretty crazy. Look at it. The life of a newborn baby 
is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. That's right. That's a human being is even lower than a dog. Think about that. So here it is. This is when it was first uh, passed by, uh, protected by law. And if you actually try to go to your local school board and have something taught against evolution, they come after you. Isn't that nice? So the teaching of evolution, we're going to, we defend and protect it from secular uh, secular attack, right? Uh, keep evolution in the science classroom and creationism out. They specifically hate it. They hate you for believing in it. They are not free, uh, open. They're not free thinkers. They're not open minded. They don't like opposition. They don't like questions. They're as closed off as can, you could possibly think when it comes to this topic. They hate it deep down. They pretend they're, they're free thinkers. No, they're not. Try to put something on your scientific test that's not in the textbook. You're going to fail. There's It's obvious. I mean, come on. But the fact is that, I mean, if you if you were going to have any model, any model should be open for falsification. Because evolution is not, it's pretty clear that it's, it's pseudoscience beyond. And But they believe it. They admit right here, the problem with those that are unable to see evolution, I think, is that they don't have imaginations. That's right. Yeah, I guess we don't believe have enough SpongeBob imagination in ourselves. Look at this. Oh, how many times has the eye evolved? Over 50 to 100 times. That's right. No faith involved there, right? How about over vast amounts of time? Over 550 million years, enough time for the complex eye to have evolved more than 1,500 times. Ooh, man, that's a whole lot. Amazing how we never see that today, though, huh? <laughs> so... And in wrapping up this, how come it's it's so? How come people are so indoctrinated? How come their minds are so like wrapped up in this? Because clearly, some people know that there's an alternative way of thinking. Well, you can also follow that to what's known as the sunk cost fallacy. That's when people have an incentive to be behind this. They spent a lot of their time in school. They make money behind it. They they teach it, and you can find once you go behind the reason why. You'll always find that's the main reason why people are so adamant about it. And then there's people that are just so indoctrinated. They're, they explode over the subject. You know, they're the people when you go online that are in the comment section all day long, ah, screaming and yelling at their keyboard. I can't believe you don't believe in evotardism. You know, they just, they just unhinged. But the unfortunate part is Christians. The, if you find yourself being a Christian with siding with God-hating atheist and admitted Satanist on subjects like creation versus evolution, just to attack your own fellow believers, it's probably time you should reevaluate your position. You should ask yourself, why are they so eager to team up with me? They hate me. They don't like what I stand for. They hate Jesus. They hate God. They're, um, they don't have any respect for me. Uh, you know what? But yet now they want to team up with me because I'm attacking these people. Hmm. You should let that sink in some time and, and really reevaluate that, that concept. The next time somebody that that hates your position is teaming up with you, let that sink in. That a boy, excellent research. I appreciate the passion. So, well, firstly, lots of good feedback and comments from the live chat, lively live chat tonight. <laughs> um, I dare Vice Rhino to counter that information. So here's my question to you. As you know, a lot of these militant critics out there, the Dr. Dan Stern Cardinals of the world, Jordan from Reasons to Doubt, our favorite critic, Guts at Gibbon, they would assert to your model on explaining the dates derived by radioisotope dating, they would say that, oh, we've countered those, we've already addressed those. And so my question to you, Matt, have they actually countered your model. You've debated Grayson from base theory for three hours on the topic. And so you've defended your model here. And so how have the critics in engaged your arguments on this topic? Have they actually overturned what you're saying, my brother? I don't know why they would overturn their own side. These are all secular uh, evidence. When you go and you look at the seafloor dates and you look at those studies, those aren't, those aren't, this is not my research. I'm not in the Proton 21 laboratory, guys. This is your camp. This is the evolutionary camp. This just forming it. I take what I see from the studies and I say, look, I present it. If you want to refute it, you're not refuting me. You're refuting what I found and what I'm presenting. And 
for them to refute it just goes to show you how, um, uh, I guess, non-confident they are in their own studies, right? They're going to say like, oh, well, we refuted your nonsense. Oh, you so you refuted your own side. So that just means you don't even believe in half the things that you read and study yourself because you're refuting your own content. When we present pedigree mutation rate studies, we're not presenting just Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's mutation rate, right? This is the only study done on pedigree mutation rates from a creationist is just him, but we present everybody else. So they go, oh, we got to refute this. This stuff is dumb. Well, be my guest. It's literally in the peer-reviewed published literature I mean, you're just refuting your own camp. So they say, oh, you know, we've got the truth. Well, that's what I'm presenting. I'm presenting to you the secular published studies that the that are admitting that that is not the case. So take it up with them. Don't take it up with me. You're complaining to, your, to yourselves at this point. I think you brought up a, a lot of excellent points. So would you agree, Matt, that um, based on, on a lot of what you're saying, I don't want to misrepresent what you're saying in some instances, but basically we understand from Genesis, God creates a variety of animals. We would hold to the created heterozygosity hypothesis or uh, design diversity, right? So he creates a variety of animals, variety of plants. And so why wouldn't God also create a variety of atoms? Let's say uranium atoms, lead atoms, carbon atoms. And so the question I would have is what was the original composition of these newly created rocks? Because when it comes to newly created trees, well, if scientists, let's say we were a couple of scientists and we went up and analyzed the leaves of those trees, right, Matt? Well, we would most likely find chlorophyll, just like we find in leaves today. Even though these newly created leaves did not actually come about through normal processes. And so, when God created the first rocks, would they not have had certain atoms in them? And then if scientists come along, let's say an hour or so after creation, and they analyze these rocks, if they were to conclude, based on the uranium and the lead atoms, that these are billions of years old, well, would they not be in serious error since those atoms were just created? Matt, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And the critic comes along and they say, well, I guess God is trying to trick us then. That becomes their only argument. Well, if we're testing a tree that was just created the day before, or two days before, and it shows really old, why is God trying to trick us? It's like, well, there's no one to trick if you're dead from not being able to eat. So he had to do something for Adam. He had to make a tree with fruit on it, which right. usually takes 15 years for most trees. So, yeah, you can say that um, there we that's why you and I like to take the limiting factors. What puts an right. age limit on something? And well, and we that's why I appreciate you focusing on those limiting factors, because Adam, right, he would have looked like probably a 30 year old. And so he would have. And this is why I prefer functionally mature rather than somebody saying, well, the earth was created with a parent age. I would argue it was created functionally mature because when right. somebody says the old, the earth looks old, well, that's fallacious. What are they comparing this earth to? Do right. we have earth two, earth three, earth four in the multiverse to compare this earth to? We only, <laughs> we also only have one universe. So when somebody says this universe looks old, that's subjective. It's arbitrary because do we have another universe to compare it to? And so Adam, if we were to analyze, if he would have got a, a full, physical examination, height, weight, we would conclude oh, he's about 30 years old, his hair, his fully functioning organs and so on, right? We conclude he's old. But then if we were, were to do a complete blood count and do some tests on his uh, blood, we would be forced to conclude that he's young. He has no evidence for age at all. And so there would be a mix of evidence within Adam in the same way that there's a mix of evidence in the earth. And it's those limiting factors, though, that preclude an earth that's 4.8 billion years old. Right. 
Yeah, and we can find that down the line. Like you said, we can do that with Adam simply by looking at his mutations in his blood. We could look at his telomeres and they would be long. And then he might be eating from the tree of life would be regenerating him at the same time. So that would also throw a lot of anomalies in the thing. So right. when we're looking at the old world, obviously there's elements. You can't have an old world without potassium. Plants won't grow. Well, that's a radioactive mm -hmm. element. So to say like a lot of the, like some one young earth creation model in particular that puts all of the radioactive elements being made during the flood. Well, now you have a problem because remember it shows the early zircon crystals show no plate tectonic movement. Evolution needs plate tectonic movement. You know why? Geothermal vents are what supposedly created life. So you need abiogenesis to occur next to ge geothermal vents. But if they're not occurring from heat being generated from subduction, now you don't have life either. So see, right. they're stuck between a rock and a hard place now because the early evidence shows what we would expect to see, a worldwide continent not moving. So you would disagree with some creations that say we can't have any radioactive elements at creation because that would be harmful. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we Is need that why they put them mostly in the flood? Right, exactly. But then again, how do you get the earth itself rotating? If you believe in a round earth that rotates, you're going mm. to need a radioactive element to core and power the earth itself to rotate. It's powered by radioactive elements. So if they're not there, if there's nothing going on, you get like no movement either. So yeah, radioactive right. elements had to have formed in creation week. They had to have. And now we have and evidence. Are they not necessary for the soil, for the energy, for uh, a, a certain degree of heat, for you know vegetables, fruit, soil to, to be um, healthy, to be uh, working well for Adam and Eve to eat, to consume, to enjoy, right? Exactly. So how much accelerated decay then would you put forth during the flood? Um, well, um, at, during the flood, it doesn't need to necessarily be much at all. Um, mm -hmm. There can be some, but to, to cram in a billion years or, or more, that's just, there's no reason for that. Maybe right. a little bit, but our moon and, and debris that we find in space from asteroids date the exact same as the age of the earth. So if the earth is the same age as everything else, then it would be billions of years younger if we went through massive amounts of accelerated nuclear decay. You see the problem with invoking accelerated nuclear decay? If the moon was created after the earth, but the earth is the same age as the moon, how could we have accelerated billions of years? It makes no sense. The moon would have had to accelerate a nuclear decay at the same time as earth. <laughs> so to explain the dates we get using potassium, argon, uranium, lead, so on and so forth, through accelerated decay is just creating a bigger problem, a heat and radiation problem. But you're pointing out that accelerated decay, at least to the point where, hey, we got a billion years worth of decay in a year's time is not necessary. Right. We can have isolated areas where there's accelerated nuclear decay in small, small areas, but the whole world itself. Oklo reactor. No, yeah, the Oklo reactor would be a perfect example. But the but the earth itself, the whole thing, there's no reason to invoke that, especially now that we see the parent to daughter ratio, ratio isotopes forming at this disproportionate ratio where the daughter elements are super high and they're rapidly creating all of this lead. That's, that's perfect. That's all we needed to see to show you that it, does, it doesn't matter. It's uh, so Do I disagree with the rate team? In that area, yeah. There, you see the rate team did the same thing that evolution did. They found the lead and they said, okay, we found the zircon crystal and there's this much lead in there. So how did it get there from that thing? And they go, well, it must have accelerated. That would explain why there's so much helium inside of it. And, but also explain, and, and so that was the limiting factor, right? Why is there such a lightweight helium element in such high ratios in there? It should have leaked out by now. So they said, we can't have deep time and young time at the same time. So what would explain it? They invoked accelerated nuclear decay as their only logical explanation. So it's true. That's good. It's the, the best case scenario that they had at the time. They did not have the evidence from the Proton 21 laboratories. Now we do. So there's no reason to agree with the rate team's accelerated nuclear decay. It literally invokes God having to stop the earth itself and remove the heat from it in some type of a miracle. And we just don't even need that anymore. There's no reason to invoke that. Right. So there's certain aspects of the rate findings that you'd agree with. Right. Other aspects that you may not agree with, like the accelerated de decay, because a lot of the experiments they've done, let's say with 
testing the validity of these dating methods. From my understanding, they've taken samples from the Grand Canyon and they subjected them to different dating methods. And what they got was discordant dates. And the beginning of your presentation, you went over a new paper coming out of the ICC, if I'm not mistaken, showing discordant dates as well. And one of the lava flows that they looked at at the bottom of the Grand Canyon gave different results depending on what method they used. So one method actually gave three times the age as another method, which I believe was the potassium argon age. And so would you agree that obviously with the amount of discordant dates that we get with rocks of known age, dating methods are essentially unreliable? Well, I, I always see them like very, you can make get a clock today made from the half-life of radioactive elements and they make the best watches you'll ever buy. So they tell very good time. But if you go backwards in time past when the watch was made, it's still telling you a time, but, right. the, but that doesn't exist as a history. Yeah. So yes, they tell very good dates. You can go backwards in time and you can date things with radioactive elements. But once you get to a certain point, there's just no more history. It just doesn't exist. But you can still get random dates, of course, just like you could rewind your clock and still get a time, but the time doesn't matter. The clock was made when the creator said it was in the in the manual we know when the crop we know we have the manual <laughs> so it, it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier these newly created rocks they'd have uranium lead in them and so somebody going in and testing those rocks using uranium to lead dating methods they would conclude a history for those rocks even though there is no history like you're saying with the watches Right, exactly. It depends on the uh, depends on the method. You mentioned potassium argon, so that was one that we had went over earlier with the seafloor, right? Right. So they're they're using based on what they saw above the ground with a volcano, and they assume that the same was true under the ocean, and it's not. It's not true at all. There's a two major factors that are making the ages exponentially grow off the charts fast, like mm. literally 500 feet down. You're watching something that occurred over just a few years, date 22 million years old. It's case closed. That's why the age shows that it's so old when it's not old at all. And now we have evidence. Well, I the think, secular literature. Yeah, I believe it's a very powerful model that you have here. Very good explanatory uh, power. And I like that you pointed to several limiting factors. So just like the Adam example, we would find a mix of evidence. Some lines of evidence suggesting that he's old and has a history like his height and weight that could be akin to distant starlight and dating methods. And you have an excellent explanation for dating methods. But we understand that your secularists are going to conclude a history where there is none, just like with created heterozygosity. Right. And this goes back to basic genetics, you know, capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. You'd be genetically heterozygous at that low size essentially it just means adam and eve would have been created in a state of dna diversity so apply that heterozygosity to a million positions within the genome you've got a lot of available diversity for change for adaptation so on and so forth and so scientists if they were to come about and do a dna test and they'd look at all these dna differences and then they would look at the dna differences within the different kinds and across the different kinds they would conclude a history where there is no history but as we've been discussing, Matt, if you were to look to the uh, blood test of Adam, you'd be forced to conclude that he's young. And so in the earth, our model, we can make predictions. We, let's find the same thing. So we got distant starlight. We got dating methods. Okay. You pointed to diamonds. Well, according to the conventional model, diamonds are extremely old. They're the hardest substance on the, uh, the earth. They're resistant to contamination uh, and they have an estimated age. I think the younger ones have an estimated age of a billion years. <laughs> now we know C14 has a half-life of 5,500 years, right? And so you should find no C14 in a sample that's supposedly a billion or more years old. Actually, carbon decay so quickly that if every single atom in the universe was made of carbon, it would all decay within a million years easily. And yet we look to these diamonds, we've addressed the contamination, we've addressed 
the idea that they could be recharged by uh, nearby nuclear material. That doesn't work either. And there's measurable C14 in them. And so this provides us with a limiting factor, which is consistent with the model being proposed. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, I, I love the limiting factors things. You would think, how about trees? We both know that there are some trees that do not die. Right? Actually, They're and before you continue, Matt, I just want to sure. say this. Andrew Cumming, another one of our favorite skeptics, he says C14 in diamonds again, Jan. This is a fallacy. It's kind of a form of gaslighting because the critics know that they can't refute C14 in diamonds. And so rather than address it in a sophisticated manner, they want to say, oh, C14 in diamonds again, Jan. Right? They want to psychologically convince the audience that's not a good argument, even though it's a very powerful argument. It's a form of dodging, dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge, the five Ds of evolutionary dodgeball. And so my question to Andrew, anybody in the chat, let's see what your best argument is because we've done a significant amount of shows with PhDs addressing all of the rescue devices for C14 and diamonds. We've done comprehensive shows on this topic. We've discussed it with Mike Ord, Sal Giardina, who's a geologist, Dr. Charles Jackson. We've discussed it with Professor David McQueen. I mean, we really engage their rescue devices. So let's see what the best possible response is to C14 and diamonds. Okay, Matt, go ahead, brother. Sure, sure. So we're gonna be looking at the oldest living organisms on earth, which are trees, and they do not die. Uh, I mean, they're not all immortal. I'm just saying that if something, unless something kills them or they die from drought or can't drink, they will die. But these organisms will not just naturally die on their own unless something causes it. And so looking at trees, what would we expect to find if there was a global flood? We would expect to find that trees do not live past that global flood. It should be obvious. It should be, I mean, really, really obvious. So when we're looking at these trees, we find the oldest ones right up here. Um, the Great uh, Basin Bristlecone Pine at 4,900 in this by when this was taken and another bristlecone pine 4800 so again this one was taken from i think wikipedia 4900 plus the methuselah tree 4852 and what do we see according to uh, harlan the tree was 5062 years old and is still living in 2010. that means it's still alive and it is the oldest tree we have how come it is not older than the global flood that should make people pause for concern Oak is the most reliable tree type uh, ring known to man, right? It is, the, it is not known for a single case of an annual growth ring missing. Well, what do we have? The oldest uh, great oak is about 2,000 years old. So why aren't these organisms that do not die going past the flood? It should be pretty obvious. But again, it goes back to the Occam's razor, which I think people need to use a lot more often. <laughs> so that was it. I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> oh, that's good. Another uh, argument you looked to as well, which I thought was great, had to do with your cold slabs, these massive slabs of cold rock that are found deep within the earth, that if they were taken down there through subduction millions to billions of years ago, they should have either warmed up to the nearby material or they should have completely melted. Hey, you're kind of like lagging. You're kind of lagging out a minute. Is there something going on on your uh, computer? Am I am I lagging right now? To me, uh, audience, is he lagging out here? Um, he's you're lagging to me. Yeah, you're kind of okay. robot. Mm. Am I still <laughs> roboting? No. Go ahead and keep going. I'll let you know. Okay, let me know. It, it could have been. It's, you sound it says good my, now. It says my internet's good. There's no okay. issues. Right. Alan says no. It could have been All on right. your end. I'm not sure. Okay, usually if there's lagging from my system, it'll it'll let me know. But we'll watch out for it. And so, okay, everyone says it looks good on their end. Appreciate it, guys. But if there's issues, uh, Matt, let me know, brother, because I want you to hear what we're saying. So cold slabs. These cold slabs found deep within the earth. They should have melted or at least warmed up. For the audience sake, it'd be like, I got a coffee here. If I were to walk away, let's say I were to put an ice cube in, in my hot coffee, right? I were to walk away, my wife comes downstairs, the ice cube hasn't melted, there's still steam coming from the coffee. What would we conclude? That the coffee's been sitting there for a long time? 
or the coffee has been sitting there for a short amount of time. Well, obviously, if it's still steaming and the ice cube hasn't yet melted, then we would conclude that it hasn't been sitting there for a long time. And that would be the most parsimonious explanation for the cold slabs taken down there through runaway subduction just thousands of years ago rather than millions. Matt, is, is my audio uh, coming in currently, brother? I think you're on. I think you're on mute. You just started chopping up just right there at the end. Okay. It, it could be on your could be on your end because it's saying that it's good for for me. Well, yeah, one thing I'll say to, to some of the skeptics in the chat is the rate results were actually confirmed by secular scientists. Okay, in the UC Riverside Radiocarbon Lab. This was subsequent to the rate results. And they, they had eight diamonds that yielded radiocarbon ages from 64,900 to 80,000 years. And a ninth diamond was cut into six equal fragments and yielded radiocarbon ages from 69,400 years to 70,600 years. Okay. And so the, the carbon 14 was evenly distributed and intrinsic to the diamond. This falsifies the idea that it's due to contamination. And we've discussed that many times. T-Rock, I'll, I'll send it to you, brother. It's also iterated in a lecture from Dr. Andrew Snelling. And so I'll send that to you as well. Now, Matt, here's a common misconception. <laughs> So Lorraine is saying still not close to 6,000, right? Okay, so we're getting thousands of years old, right? 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 years for these diamonds that have high levels of C14 in them. There shouldn't be any. There shouldn't be any if they're a billion or more years. That's the point, okay? So why not 6,000 though, Matt? Oh, for a lot of reasons. Think about it. Every single time a volcano goes off, it dumps tons of carbon into the atmosphere. You need carbon for life. You need what, what is being produced by by trees for us to breathe. And it, it's the whole atmosphere. Everything is is being reused. So you're going to get all kinds of anomalous dates with carbon itself if you're uh, even around like a fire. So volcanic activity itself is going to throw off carbon dating around certain aspects. Um what so about sure, the decay can, of the magnetic field too? It would have been stronger in the past. That would right. obviously have an effect on the atmosphere. C-14 is created through cosmic ray bombardment in the atmosphere, right? Right, exactly. So if it was created already in the very beginning, how much of it, again, it goes back to your question, how much carbon was there on Earth and in the beginning? Probably quite a bit based on the atmosphere and how the Earth looked and how it functioned. So there would have been a lot more before the flood. So how about after when there was a global flood with worldwide volcanism occurring, creating an ice age? Imagine how much carbon was being dumped in the atmosphere then. So the further you go back in time, the closer you get to the flood, the higher ages you're gonna get with, with C14. The point right. is that's not a reliable age. That's not an exact age. What we're showing here is a limiting factor. You find in coal, in diamonds, dinosaur soft tissue, you find detectable levels of C14 where there should be none. Or if there is some, it should be so small that clearly it's just background detection or contamination, but that's not what we find. Right. Exactly. It's all based on a myth that was created by a lie and peddled by nonsense, you know? That's it. Right. It's amazing that people still defend it. They know. They literally watched me show you that you were lied that they were lied to. And instead of like going, oh, that makes sense, they get mad and then they defend the lying position. Isn't that odd? Isn't that strange? Yeah. Very peculiar, you know. So Matt, we're gonna move into. So I appreciate this. It's been very comprehensive. We're gonna move into a teaser, just a minute teaser for the movie documentary that we have premiering tomorrow. Obviously, this is an important phase of our show. And then I'm going to move into dismantling whale evolution comprehensively, okay? So firstly, is, is your system working uh, good now or is it still lagging on your end? It's fine. Okay. Because I was going to say you could leave the studio and then come back and refresh it. But if it's good, then 
You don't have to do that. It's up to you. So I'll play the teaser. Since I'm going to be presenting on whale evolution, we've been here for a couple hours now. I'm going to run to the restroom. And so as I'm doing that, can you explain the importance of this movie, the work that has been put into it, and just go over some of the lines of evidence for a historical, specifically a biblical Noah, that's going to be presented in it. Before you do that, I'll uh, premiere the teaser here, okay? So let me share screen, make sure that I am sharing the audio. There we go. Now, to those in the audience, you definitely don't want to miss this premiere. So go to the channel, the main channel, click live. Actually, don't click live. So but live is where all our live shows are going to be. So you can see we got quite a lot going on over the next uh, couple months. It's been quite a year so far. We've had a ton of epic shows, epic debates, must watch open mics. I highly recommend people check out the Ian Juby, Paul Price open mic on Polly Straight Trees if they have not yet done so. Okay, go to videos. It's a video premiere right here. Quest for Noah, a true story, must watch documentary movie. You're not going to want to miss it. Tons of amazing evidence, some excellent editing, AI, so on and so forth. And so this is going to be a short teaser. I've got a longer teaser that's about six minutes. We're going to wrap up our show with the longer one. But for now, we just have a minute teaser. And so let me hit mute, Matt. We'll do the teaser. Once we're done with the teaser, spend a few minutes. And if you had visuals or something you wanted to go through as well, you know, it's totally up to you. Just hyping people up for the quest for Noah. So here we go, guys. We're going on mute in three, two, one. So, Matt, we spent a ton of time (laughs) over the last week behind the scenes. I must have watched the film a dozen times because the editing process, final stages, we're going through it. And, you know, we're we're picking out little things. We want to add little things. So we want to make sure that it's good for, for our audience. But it's comprehensive. It's irrefutable. The evidence is undeniable for the biblical Noah. And we demonstrate this through numerous lines of evidence. Did you want to briefly go over some of that, my brother? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I thought this movie would be quite fun because it's unlike a lot of things that are already out there. A lot of things are mostly hyper-focused on one specific thing. And I wanted to come in at this with a different perspective, saying if if I was a... Um, working for the FBI, and I wanted to prove, did Noah live or exist? How would I go about doing that? So you got to look at all the different branches of science. You got to look everywhere. You want as much as you possibly can to deduce and be like, okay, fable, fable, uh, not very good. Oh, that's pretty nice. We'll dig into that one. So what I did is I said, okay, let's let's broad spectrum this. Let's start out with archaeological evidence. Is there any for that person existing? And then we can go for genealogies. Are there any that go back? Um, are they actual? Are they true? Or are they just made up? Or is there historical evidence, linguistic evidence, physical evidence, which is probably one of my favorite chapters in the thing, and then genetic evidence, and then overall corroborating evidence coming from a little bit of everything. So 
there's a lot of people um, in the world that want to say, like, I have Noah's necklace or something, right? Those are relics. I'm not really interested in those. Those can just those can be hearsay, right? They're, the Catholic Church doesn't really allow too much scientific investigation on some of those things anyway. So I don't want to go really too much by hearsay. I'm going more by the physical evidence in every single one of these cases. The only one I ran into a dead end recently was that I found a person that actually lived locally out here by me, Palm Desert area. Um, he had all the photographs of being at the Armenian Stonehenge which you'll see from the video is actually a grave of one of the patriarchs and all of the photos that was taken. He actually died right at the start of COVID. His wife emailed me back saying that we don't know where any of the images are. Um, that was one of the biggest letdowns because I wanted all the images that he had of the area. But other than that, everything else fell into place perfectly. And I have it in the book as well. I created a book I, create, I made it black and white so it would be really cheap. So it's like under $5 so anybody can get it. And it goes over all of the different flood legends from around the world and all of the different legends of the Tower of Babel, which also are around the world as well. That was what was really neat about studying and going really deep on the subjects. We obviously know that there's flood legends, but I didn't know that they actually match in every culture as well that they have a global or that they have a, a <laughs> Tower of Babel uh, narrative as well. So that was pretty cool. And so I, I touch on a few local or global flood uh, topics and, and a local flood idea in the video, but not much. And then because those already have been addressed in ad nauseum to, in my mind. So I'm not going to really focus on things that have already been discussed. I wanted to make this a more entertaining and interesting video and hit people with exciting visuals and at the same time have a great story, but not be redundant and then have guests on as well and interview them and get their perspective as well. So that that's pretty much the movie in, in a nutshell. Well, and, and I love that the interview sections, like with myself, Dr. Dan Biddle, Dr. Dino, I like they're fast paced, they're well edited, they present the necessary information, especially Dr. Dan Biddle's section on biblical longevity. And just the the edits, everything about it is is fantastic. I'm really pumped for people to see it. And this is a new series that we want to do. Matt, you and I were talking, we want to make it this the quest series. So the quest for Noah, the quest for Adam, the quest for separate ancestry, which is the book that I'm currently working on. And I got a lot of great information there, the quest for Eve. And so the, these movies, these books take a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort. So if you enjoy the quest for Noah and you want to see more in the quest series, then consider supporting us. You can do so right on our website, Patreon, you become a member, but it allows us to continue doing this full time. Yeah. We do. And everybody, we made this video so that it's unmonetized, which means there will be no commercials. You'll be able to skip them if they pop up, which means I spent three months making this. So make sure to join the Patreon and support Donnie's channel here or else I won't make him any more videos. <laughs> there you go. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work, brother, and it's uh, it's going to be fruitful. So I appreciate that. Doki, appreciate that, brother. Okay, so tomorrow it's premiering on this channel, Quest for Noah, True Story. Check it out, video section. What time? 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock EST. And so, okay, uh, yes, Common Sense Gracious. Wait, is the movie being hosted here? Yes. Tolkien. Tolkienomics. I am a Lord of the Rings fan, so I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the support. Okay, Matt, we're going to jump into our next phase. It's been comprehensive. So what we've done is we have dismantled Vice Rhino. It's kind of nostalgic. Remember going back maybe three years ago, we did a full video response to Vice Rhino. Oh, yeah. Trying to get any any interaction we could from him. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's one of those guys like Cy Man Dan. You know, they're a gift to creation science because they give us all this content, but they don't defend their arguments. <laughs> so we've gone through homology, embryology, vestigial structures, geology, dating methods. Well, next episode we do, we're going to have Ken here, obviously, discuss the fossil record in even more detail. But whale evolution, that's a big one. And the evolutionary community seems to, to think or believe that they have a, an irrefutable argument here, transitional series. And so I'm going to share screen and just go over about a minute of this video from 
crash course. Let me know if the audio is coming in. And right here, great channel. I utilize it all the time for genetics and biology related study. And he's got a video, evidence for evolution. Evolution, it's a thing. So once we're done with Vi Vice Rhino with Kent, we are going to go through the whole video. Line by line, sentence by sentence, we'll give our commentary. Kent will give his commentary. But he does provide whale evolution, the whale series, as an example of irrefutable evidence for common descent. Many other channels have done the same, stated clearly, for example. And so I want to play just a minute of this video. But mind you, our, our next episode or video on this topic, probably in the next few weeks or so, will be going through this entire video, sentence by sentence, line by line. So let me hit mute on my end so there's no echo, and we'll let him lay out the argument. For instance, fossils taught us that whales used to walk. Whales are cetaceans, a group of mammals that includes porpoises and dolphins, and biologists long suspected that whales descended from land mammals. Partly because some modern whales still have the vestigial remnants of a pelvis and hind limb bones. But it wasn't until recently, the 1990s and 2000s, that the pieces really came together. First, paleontologists discovered fossils of dorodons, cetaceans that had different skulls from modern whales but still had the same vestigial leg bones. Then they found even older fossil remains from another cetacean that actually had hind legs and a pelvis. But the pelvis wasn't fused to the backbone like ours is, so it did swim like a whale. But more importantly, it still had ankle bones, and they were ankle bones that are unique to the order that includes bison, pigs, hippos, and deer. So by following these clues left behind in fossilized bones, paleontologists were able to track the origin of whales back to the same origin as bison and pigs. This leads us to another series of facts that evolution explains, not how animals... Okay, so let's stop it there. Gave us a few examples to work with, Duradon, Rhodocetus. And I'm going to go through all of the common examples. We're going to go through the so-called vestigial hind limbs, or in those cases, miniature hind limbs. And so I will share a screen here. And we're going to have some fun. Whale evolution. Does this supposed whale series provide irrefutable evolution for or evidence for common descent? Matt, is that coming in okay? Audio, everything good? Okay. You're on mute, but I'm assuming you said yes. yes. So yeah. <laughs> did, did, did whales evolve from a land mammal like Crash Course says here? The evidence actually, and I would say unsurprisingly, says no. And I'll explain why in this presentation. It's interesting. Charles Darwin, when he first proposed an idea for how whales came about, he thought, and he went into a, a description as to why bears may have evolved into whales, given how they spend lots of time in in the water. And so, as you can see here, uh, we've got a, a phylogeny in Figure One from Indohyus, Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, Basilosaurus, and then a, a modern cetacean. Cetaceans, based on phylogenetic data according to the evolutionary model, are most similar to artiodactyls. And those are hoofed mammals that include hippos, pigs, and deer. Now, as we know, whales today, they're constrained to the sea. And advocates of common descent, like our friend here from Crash Course, believe there was a time when whales walked. And that's how he started off his argument there. The fossils of these so-called walking whales actually go back about 50 million years. And so they have somewhere between like eight and 10 million years to take, Matt, to take this, notice over here, Pachycetus, the small wolf-like creature, or if you want to go with Indohyus, even smaller, from my understanding, into a blue whale, a hundred feet. This is a gray whale, but a blue whale can grow to a hundred feet. Here's a Pachycetus. Just notice the size comparison. And so they have a very small amount of time to explain, Basilosaurus was massive as well, 75 feet, I believe. And so here's a size comparison, Pachycetus skeleton with a, a fully aquatic whale. 
And so relatively short amount of time, evolutionary speaking, for these pressures, gene flow, natural selection, epigenetics, mutations, all the different mechanisms that they look to, to explain whale evolution. And so there's a lot of wishful thinking and storytelling, unfortunately, in this argument. And we're going to cover all of that. So here's the icons of whale evolution in a nutshell. Okay, so we got Indohyus and Pachycetus. And I'm going to show everybody why this is the case, that these two examples are just small land mammals. Ambulocetus, Myocetus, Cuchocetus, and Rhodocetus were amphibious mammals, similar to what we see today with sea lions, a walrus, for example. And they were well designed for that transitional environment between sea and land. And they spent part of their lives on land and parts in water. And so it kind of makes sense of their uh, mor morphology, intermediate morphology. Basilosaurus and Duradon, that's uh, an easy one. They were just fully aquatic whales, now extinct. So here's an example of their icons, starting with Indohyus at the bottom, who isn't even uh, categorized, uh, categorized as a cetacean. Indohyus would be, taxonomically speaking, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species would be in the uh, artiodactyl group, okay? Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, all the way up to Basilosaurus and Blue Whale. So notice that these can be broken down into fully terrestrial. So there's massive gaps. I'm gonna show even more of the, the gaps that exist. Then you got primarily terrestrial with this group. Ambulocetus, Rhodocetus, and then fully aquatic. But all of the walking whales are either fully terrestrial animals or amphibious land animals, similar to sea lions or otters. The most important transition of all from amphibious to fully aquatic is missing. So again, here's a size comparison. Definitely stretches the imagination to believe that a little wolf-like creature evolved into the blue whale. Over time, indirectly, of course, it's not a straight line, uh, the evolutionary model. So Pachycetus. Pachycetus is considered a cetacean primarily because of its ear bone, which scientists argue is similar to modern cetaceans, whales today, but different in all extant land-dwelling mammals. This is a specialized thickened ear bone, the involucrum is what it's called in technical terms. And it helps cetaceans to hear underwater. Now, Indohyus actually also has this special ear bone and yet isn't classified as a cetacean like Pachycetus. It's classified as artiodactyl. And so the question is, do we now expand the classification of cetacean to include Indohyus? Or that this specific feature ceases to now characterize cetaceans? Right. This is the problem with taxonomical uh, classification systematics. Why should we call Pachycetus clearly just a land dwelling animal? Why should we call Pachycetus a cetacean or walking whale? Because apparently this special ear bone that characterizes a cetacean characterizes a cetacean, except when it doesn't, when it doesn't work. So it's subjective and it's arbitrary. So this whale ancestor most often cited is Pachycetus, discovered in uh, Pakistan, a four-legged land animal, somewhat like a wolf. In reality, the original fossil consisted of only the skull and years later, more partial bones were added. Yet the artist's sketches of the creature show it swimming and catching fish. Is this convincing evidence of a pre-whale? No. So basically, when they first found these fossils, very scattered, fragmented, okay, a lot of it missing, they depicted Pachycetus like this, because this is the, the basic body type morphology that they need for whale transitions. This is how they depicted it. Once they found more bones, so notice here, uh, Gaindrich, his first reconstruction, then what they actually found, the more complete skeleton, this is the new reconstruction. Totally different from the original reconstruction. And that's why, you know, fossils are fickle and they can essentially sing any story that you want them to. And so Pachycetus, nothing special about Pachycetus. Yes, the involucrum, this uh, ear bone, it is present also in Indohyus, 
which is not classified as as a cetacean. But remember, today, the diversity that we see on the planet is only a snapshot of the overall diversity that has existed on the planet. So the pre-flood world, which is reflected in the fossil record, comprises a significant amount of diversity. And so in the fossil record, we find some land mammals with some interesting features that land mammals today may not have. Okay, so here's uh, some good information. As more fossils are discovered, our concept of the anatomical diversity of certain groups must expand. And that was the question with Indohias. And that's why they did not include Indohias as a cetacean. Certain anatomical traits thought to be unique or particular to particular mammalian orders turn up as chimeric assortments in other orders. Rather than demonstrating evolution, the chimeric co-occurrence of cetacean and non-cetacean features in extinct mammals only shows that certain features thought to be essentially cetacean are not exclusively cetacean after all. And again, it makes sense of the fact that today is only a small snapshot of the overall biological diversity that has existed on the planet. So there's Pachycetus, nothing uh, special about Pachycetus. Indohyus, okay, just a small land-dwelling mammal. Indohyus did have really dense bones, leg bones, and dense leg bones, similar to a hippo, what a hippo has actually helps animals in the water. And they specifically help them uh, stay weighed down as they're moving around in, in the water. And scientists, they also looked at, in Indohyus, uh, the ankle bone, which is actually called the astralagus, and it's shaped much like a pulley. And so these are a couple examples, just minor uh, features or traits that they wanna now put it in that whale uh, lineage, when they're nothing more than, as I said at the beginning here, small land mammals. Okay, there's huge gaps. We're gonna see as we continue on these, these gaps. So the next one, popular one, Ambulocetus. Lived about 48 million years uh, ago in Pakistan as well, if I'm not mistaken. And you'll find in the conventional literature, you can also watch videos on this topic from proponents of evolution. And they'll point out that Ambulocetus wasn't great in the water, nor was it remarkable on land. And they'll tell you that it was it was a strong swimmer, but it was not uh, that fast or efficient. On land, it's awkward. Uh, with its legs, they kind of splay out or widen out to the sides. And they have a belly that drags on the ground, essentially, nearly drags on the ground. And the snout, the snout is really elongated, which they would kind of need if they need something transitioning into a whale. But that's not a feature that says it's it's a cetacean. I mean, look at some uh, dogs today, dog breeds, like a greyhound. They got the long, the long snout as well. But it was elongated, it was heavy, and it might have even been challenging to raise its, uh, its head. But Ambulocetus was perfectly equipped and designed for its environment, that transitional environment from sea to land. And so it lived in partially fresh water, environments where it hung out in the shallows to find prey. And so basically this is nothing more than a mammalian ambush predator with a long snout, very similar to what? Crocodiles today, as they like to stay hidden and submerged in water as they sneak up on prey. Okay, so these are essentially mammalian crocodiles, which makes sense of the great diversity that's existed on this planet. Very interesting creature not evolving into a whale. So the next fossil supposedly spanning the transition is Ambulocetus, a swimming mammal. Again, only partial remains were found, so very fragmented, dispersed, and shattered. What was recovered indicated that this animal was a powerful swimmer, propelling itself much along much like a walrus. Like some other mammals, it spent time on both land and in the sea, but this does not make it transitional. It goes back to the analogy I like to make. If we're made in the image of God, then we should get a sense for how God designed the biological world based on the way we design things. And we design interesting intermediate vehicles. Take the military amphibious assault vehicle, for example. It's not great on land. It's not great for just the sea. 
but it's perfectly designed and suited for that transitional environment between sea and land. So it's well designed for that intermediate environment. We also know that environment dictates morphology and phenotype a lot of the times. And so these creatures that existed in interesting pre-flood ecosystems and environments, their morphology and the traits that they have, the, the blending of these traits would match that environment. And that's what we see with Ambulocetus. But here's some interesting points right from the conventional literature, okay? Ambulocetus has its eyes raised up on the top of its head. This is a quote from Dr. Uh, Gaindrich. And he's discovered a lot of these these fossils, and he even admits that given the way its eyes are raised up on the top of its head in a very strange way, very similar to a crocodile, it's also unusually large for an early whale. These are his words, not a creationist. And so maybe it's not in the main line or lineage of whale evolution. And evolutionary scientists such as Dr. Gaindrich believe that Ambulocetus is essentially a side branch and not the main line, a dead end. So here's Ambulocetus here. As I said earlier, it's just a mammal version of crocodiles, not evolving into a whale, uh, nothing special in terms of evolution. And you can see that it was nothing more than a mammalian ambush predator. And it had a long snout, similar to other animals that we see today. So the next example, and we saw this in crash course video, is Rhodocetus. With Rhodocetus, there are a lot of inconsistencies, and I'm excited to go through these. So there's many inconsistencies between museum representations or reconstructions of Rhodocetus and reality, what we actually see with the fossils. Okay, so reconstructions, they comprise a whale fluke and flippers, but there were no uh, fossils of the tail to actually verify or validate these reconstructions. Dr. Gaindrich, has stated that he now doubts, and you can watch this interview, he now doubts Rhodocetus had a fluke. He was specifically asked the question about the fluke, and he pointed out that he once speculated that it did have a fluke, but now no longer believes this. He also doesn't believe Rhodocetus had flippers. Rhodocetus does not have the kind of arms that could be spread out in the same way the flippers of a whale are. And this is true, this is reality, and it's not just me saying this because Dr. Gingrich, an evolutionary scientist who discovered Rhodocetus, he's saying this exact same thing. He's expressed these concerns. And so if you don't have flippers, you probably don't have a fluke tail with power swimming. And that's why, again, when you have fragmented data, when you have the fossil record, which is essentially low quality science, low confidence science, then you're going to be able to reconstruct or imagine these creatures to look very dissimilar to how they actually looked in reality. Because remember, they have those evolutionary presuppositions going into these reconstructions. So notice this, the discoverer of Rhodocetus even made a glaring admission. He said, I speculated that it might have had a fluke. And that's how it's represented and reconstructed in museums and textbooks. I now doubt that Rhodocetus would have had a fluked tail. So next we get into Duradon and also Basilosaurus. These are just fully aquatic whales. And so the fully aquatic whales are quite different to the so-called walking whales that spend a lot of time in the sea, like Ambulocetus. So going back to our original slides here, notice we have Ambulocetus, these amphibious mammals, Ambulocetus, Pachycetus, Indohyus, just basic land mammals. Then we get into Basilosaurus and also Duradon. Duradon we have right here. So these are fully aquatic. These are primarily terrestrial and fully ter uh, terrestrial. So the fully aquatic whales are quite different to the so-called walking whales that spend a lot of time in the sea, like right here. Ambulocetus. They vary in numerous ways. There's huge gaps. And right here, so Duradon. So we have huge gaps. Uh, a couple examples blowholes. Blowholes, everybody knows they're distinct, they're unique. They're located at the top of a whale's head. Whales also have flukes, 
that are not at all like the tails found in these so-called walking whales. That's why they really wanted Rhodocetus to have a fluke. Flukes are well-designed and ideal for swimming. They have tendons attached to muscles in the tail where the fluke is essentially moving independently from the tail as the whale moves along in the ocean. These uh, amphibious mammals, let's say like sea lions, they have external testicles. Whales actually have internal testicles and the testicles must be cooled or else the animal is sterile. And if an animal is sterile, well, there's no forward evolution. There has to be reproduction. Genes and traits have to be passed along. Sterility is not going to help evolution. It's not going to help common descent. And so this is a very complicated, this is a very sophisticated system that we're dealing with here. There's substantial extensive gaps between the amphibious mammals that we see here and the fully aquatic whales. Whales can also dive a thousand feet deep and can hold their breath for over an hour. And so how have these things evolved? How have, has the blowhole evolved? You're going to get a lot of storytelling. Uh, the testicles have to be cooled. This has to happen at the same time as well, or else you're going to be sterile. Okay. And so those are just a few of the many problems. And remember, these novel anatomical uh, features and traits increases oftentimes in phenotypic complexity have to happen in a short amount of time, evolutionary uh, speaking. Okay. So Duradon is a type of basilosaurid same category of basilosaurus. According to many evolutionary charts, basilosaurids were a precursor to modern whales. They are long serpent-like mammals with tiny appendages that are clearly too small for walking. But even evolutionists have expressed doubts that they are ancestral to modern whales. There's actually some overlap uh, when it comes to the basilosaurids. Refuting evolution quoted vertebrate paleontologist Barbara Jaff Stahl, the serpentine form of the body and the peculiar shape of the cheek teeth make it plain that these archaeocetes, the basilosaurids, could not possibly have been the ancestor of modern whales. Okay, well, there that goes. Indohyus, <laughs> Turidon, Basilosaurus, Pachycetus, Ambulocetus. It's a very weak chain that we have with many gaps. And remember, Without genetic mechanisms, without a mechanism that we know and understand today for these changes to occur, all these are historical reconstructions with evolutionary presuppositions imposed on the data. It's not real science. So here's a skeleton of Duradon, this early whale. Uh, you can see the tiny hind limbs below the tail. So we're going to get into that. So uh, Basilosaurus, same thing. Basilosaurus did have small hind limbs, certainly too small for walking. And teaching evolution says they were thought to be non-functional. So remember, we talked about earlier the created heterozygosity hypothesis or design diversity. So we would expect that these uh, traits in morphology, anatomy, also in genetics when it comes to ERVs, ALU sequences, pseudogenes, you know, my specialty, these have function, these have purpose. These organisms are filled with treasure rather than junk and evolutionary leftovers. So we would always predict function, some kind of purpose. These are well designed. And so when we find a purpose or a function that confirms design diversity, that confirms the common design model. So notice this, they were thought to be non-functional, but they were probably used for grasping during copulation, used for reproduction. See, this makes sense because if you look, remember, whales are a mammal. Sharks are a fish uh, and other fish in the ocean are different from mammals in many ways. Um, they give birth uh, to their live young with, with mammals uh, and also uh, breastfeed. And it's interesting because the baby whale comes out from the tail first, tail to the head, which makes sense so it doesn't drown. So you also have to have that breached position evolve as well. So there's another uh, huge gap. And so the way mammals would reproduce versus how a lot of fish reproduce through, I believe it's called spawning, where you have uh, like sharks or other fish would basically just drop their eggs and then male fish would just drop their sperm and fertilize that way. Okay. Well, a mammal would require some kind of feature or trait 
to help with the way that it reproduces, the way that it has babies, especially in light of the fact that it has mammalian features. And so it turns out that these so-called small hind limbs are used for reproduction. And this isn't just creationists saying this. Notice this. For example, the evolutionary uh, whale expert, Philip Gangrich, said, it seems to me that they could only have been some kind of sexual and reproductive clasper. And that makes sense. This is right from the conventional literature. It's all in the hips. You can read this for yourself. New research turns a long accepted evolutionary assumption on its head. Finding that far from being just vestigial, whale pelvic bones play a key role in what? Reproduction. So we have an essential function. Without reproduction, you definitely don't have evolution. You're not going to have kids. You're not going to be able to pass on your gene. So it'd be very difficult to reproduce without these. So here we go. Here's the conclusions. We've examined all of your uh, icons of whale evolution. Indohyus and Pachycetus are small mammals. Ambulocetus, Myocetus, Cuchicetus, and Rhodocetus were amphibious mammals. We've seen that. Ambulocetus essentially being a mammalian crocodile. Well designed for that transitional environment between sea and land. Not evolving into a whale. They spent part of their lives on land and parts in water. And then you've got Basilosaurus and Duradon that were just fully aquatic whales that had features, just like we see in whales today, that help with reproduction. They're not vestigial. And so some of these uh, interesting mosaics, morphological intermediates, we shouldn't use as Cratius the word transitional because there's an assumption built into that, that it's one creature transitioning into another. That's why they look to these basal features or, you know, they'll look to synapomorphies, apomorphies, they'll look to basal and derived features. And they're assuming that, well, your transitional is going to have the features, some features of the ancestor and also from the descendant. And when they say primitive or basal, that's also based on evolutionary assumptions. They're actually assuming that this is primitive and this is basal rather than just a well-designed trait, a well-designed feature, which oftentimes can be subject to degeneration. We see that a lot with the hominids, that they're pathological, but they're interpreted as being primitive or basal. Okay. No. We don't use the word transitional. We can use mosaic or morphological intermediate is good because, again, the word transitional assumes that this is one creature that's transitioning into another from another. So before the flood, there were probably biological communities unfamiliar to us today. We can understand that just by looking at the fossil record and seeing how diverse the world was in terms of plants, in terms of animals. Pre-flood ecosystems were probably more tightly structured than today and strongly biozoned. For example, the major plant groups arranged from ocean inland according to their ability to reproduce with outstanding water and plant group specific animal taxa tracking the biozonation. So the point is the pre-flood world would have had different ecosystems, different sets of biodiversity. We find some interesting creatures that are now extinct but in light of the gaps, in light of the faulty reconstructions, as we've seen with Rhodocetus, going back to Rhodocetus here, okay, these representations where the reconstructions comprise a whale flute, but yet we don't uh, have fossils that have uh, validated or verified this re reconstruction. So there's a lot of wishful thinking, there's a lot of storytelling, and a lot of evolutionary assumptions built into this whale evolution argument and so i'll wrap it up there matt and any thoughts brother and there's is there any information or data points that you wanted to contribute to this argument from whale evolution no that was uh that was your puppy today that was what you've uh been working on for a while i was just last minute gathering up stuff for the geologic record <laughs> well think about it and i've got a book here this might be a good topic for when we have Dr. Jerry Bergman back on, but he's got a very impressive section in fossil forensics going in detail on these so-called hind limbs found in creatures like Basilosaurus and also Duradon, fully aquatic whales. 
but he goes in detail, page after page, and all confirmed as well by the conventional literature on what these are used for in terms of reproduction, but in detail on each of each of the, the bones that are found. And so I went into studying, obviously, how necessary are these features for reproduction and copulation, right? And so Matt, in light of the way fish like a shark would reproduce and uh, an aquatic mammal like a whale would reproduce, don't these features make sense that these creatures have them? Well, I would say not only that, where in the world does it create or evolve the reproductive organs from its legs? If these are vestigial leg bones that turned into reproductive organs, where was the transition where it wasn't that and they gave something new? Kind of like humans from primates, right? Where did the uh, baculum bone disappear to and when did we evolve a brand new organ for reproduction? Where was that transition? It had to be instant or you can't have, right? You can't have a slow progression of it. So what was going on in the whale? It had to be the right. same as the human, right? <laughs> in the line. Exactly. Well, it's just like we see with these amphibious mammals like sea lions and then also ambulocetus, they have external testicles. Whales have internal testicles. So they would have to cool in order for them to not be sterile. So all of that evolution of these independent features and traits are going to have to happen simultaneously or it's not going to work. Right. Exactly. And uh, you made an interesting thing. You were kind of describing like a walrus to me earlier that's what it sounded like when you said yeah. it just lays on its belly and sometimes raises up uh, but it's a mammal right so that sounds like a walrus just an elongated face right and so it makes sense you know today we have these reptiles and so here's ambulocetus right and so right from the conventional literature i read many articles papers on this topic watch many videos from an evolutionary perspective and they've admitted that ambulocetus map wasn't really all that good in the water it wasn't remarkable on land it may have been a strong swimmer but it wasn't efficient it wasn't fast its belly was awkward could have dragged on the ground it had that long and heavy snout it was awkward in the way its legs were kind of splayed out to the side and it was an ambush predator very similar to crocodiles and so doesn't it make sense in light of how diverse the fossil record is the pre-flood world that we, we would have a mammal version of a crocodile even if extinct today i mean if if we're talking about that creature being alive today if it only lived in a tropical shallow region then uh and during the flood that area got destroyed and there's no place right after the flood because there's an ice age. I can understand why it's missing. <laughs> yeah. So even if it did survive, it didn't survive for very long when there was an ice age. Right. You know, and looking into this, I discovered some detailed explanations from even some in the young earth creationist camp that have suggested, well, maybe you had land dwelling cetaceans that after the flood due to pre-programmed diversity could have evolved into these fully aquatic cetaceans but in light of the examples that they actually have with endohyas pacocetus ambulocetus duradon bastosaurus I, I don't believe we need to go to that point because the examples that they provide are not strong enough or convincing enough for us to have to say, well, the ark had walking whales that evolved or adapted to the sea and the uh, uh, ocean, an aquatic lifestyle because of the many gaps. And when you break it all down, again, you got these examples that are just fully aquatic, primarily terrestrial, interesting creatures, and then fully terrestrial. So we're not, we're, we're seeing too many gaps for us to go to that extent, Matt, is, would it be your opinion as well that we wouldn't have to say, well, there may have been an ambulocetus kind of creature coming off of the ark that over the next thousand years evolved into a fully aquatic mammal. What are your, what are your thoughts on that, brother? Well, evolution teaches that um, a species, a parent ancestor doesn't have to die off. 
for it to evolve into a new species that goes along and becomes other aquatic species. So where are the Amblyocetus? Where are the an ancestors? Clearly, they could have survived because this they lived during a time when smaller organisms and species did live, right? According to the evolutionary theory. So it should have done just fine if it was able to live in the environment that it was. So where, where did they go? Like, what's going on here? Because, uh, you know, it's not like a linear process where it evolved into one thing and then it the original parent ancestor just disappeared. So what's going on? Uh, to place them on the ark is very strange. But nonetheless, I guess if they think that was a possibility, uh, that that would be some rapid evolution occurring <laughs> right. for to go into a whale from one of the smallest land mammals. And I don't believe it's necessary in light of the fact that we have these gaps and we can break down these creatures in light of their discontinuities. There's a lot of discontinuity in what we're saying here, enough to have different groups that are unrelated to each other. Like right. they Angela disagree. Right. Yeah, the, the professionals themselves disagree. So if they're not even in agreement, it's very similar to, again, human evolution. There's no concordance. They're, they disagree with one another on everything. It's just stories. Well, just like Dr. Philip Gingrich, discoverer of Rhodocetus, ended up admitting that Rhodocetus didn't even have a tail fluke. We don't have any right. evidence for the, the tail fluke, the evolution of it. We don't have evidence of the, of the blowhole, right? Because these amphibious mammals have their nostrils right at the front. And those would basically have to migrate to the back of the head like we see with mammals. And even if they found a series of fossils where you had, um, you know, the, the nostrils a little more up, then they're going to put those in, in a line. And right. then they're going to imagine, wow, it went from here, the front to the top. Right. Even that would be wishful thinking. And so I want to move here and address some of these uh, arguments or objections that we've seen. Uh I am since we've focused on quite a bit today on uh, subjects that we've been working on. Uh, Guts at Gibbon, I appreciate her the feedback and interaction. She put a lot of work into her last video, critique, critiquing my common design model and my explanation for transitional forms. So rather than giving a really comprehensive rebuttal here, I am going to work on just a line by line, sentence by sentence response to her video. So we're not going to respond to that here. That's going to be for the future as she basically just put that out. I want to work through it and give a really comprehensive response and interact with, with some of her points, many of them fair. Okay. But we've heard Matt, specifically Mark Reed. We had a great open mic debate a week or two ago, and it mostly focused on transitional fossils. These critics, they have a problem with the design model that suggests, hey, we can look to man-made things, we can look to modes of transportation and get an idea for how God designed the biological world based on the way we design things. When I was listening to the explanation from the evolutionary side for Ambulocetus, how it wasn't good on land, it wasn't the greatest in the water, it was perfectly designed and well-suited for that environment between sea and land, I thought of how well that fits with the model we've been proposing, like the military amphibious assault vehicle. Not really that great in just the sea, not all that great on just the land, but perfect for that transitional environment between sea and land. And so their arguments, Matt, I'm curious as to your thoughts. Mark Reed, he comes in and he says, well, it's a false analogy. Because in the biological world, you have things like vestigial structures and you have things like atavisms, which we don't find in man-made vehicles. And so it's a false analogy because there's too much dissimilarity when examined. I definitely have thoughts on that. What are your thoughts, brother? Well, I mean, well, what is he getting at at... Uh... He doesn't like the analogy because of, of the vestigial uh, structure, like of an of an actual organism, but uh, not taking place in a vehicle. I mean, uh, or atavism, like atavism. It's like okay, that, again, it can be like, well, look at a steering wheel. You can line up steering wheels from the past into the modern day. Um, that's a functional aspect. Your car is pretty non-functional itself when you get in them. Um, 
not much is going on until you start it up. And then once you do, a lot of the things that are not being used become functional. You know, uh, your cup holder is non-functional until you need a drink. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, yeah. cars make a good analogy. And that's literally all this is, is just an analogy. It's, it shouldn't well, be and doesn't it assume, okay, firstly, they're not going to like this analogy to begin with because they reject design. Right. So they're not re uh, rejecting the analogy because it's a good analogy. It's because they look at the biological world as being the result of natural evolutionary processes, gene flow, recombination, mutations, epigenetic, uh, epigenetics, natural selection. So they don't see a mind in the biological world. And that's basically what our uh, model is saying is that God, the ultimate mind, created the biological world. We're made in his image. We have a mind. And so we design things. But it's never going to be an apples to apples comparison because God is infinite. We are just in the infancy of recognizing good design. God designed his creations with the ability to reproduce. Imagine another two to 300 years, we're able to make these archetypes, right? We make a military amphibious assault vehicle. We make a group of them, maybe 10, and then click a button and they just replicate, they self-replicate. Well, these companies would save a lot of money. They wouldn't need as much manpower. People would be out of a job, so that wouldn't be good. But that's the point is adding reproduction adds more complexity, more problems. It just shows how great God is compared to us as we design things. But with vestigial structures and atavisms, doesn't that have evolutionary assumptions built in, Matt? Isn't that assuming that there are vestigial structures and there are atavisms? Yeah, and that we're looking at something primitive in general, right? That's, right. Um, but the funniest, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, but, uh, one of the funny things is as well is this analogy that we use from vehicles comes from their side. It's an evolutionary argument that they use to show a, a, a pattern. And we use it now because they stopped using it because vehicles have designers. And they realized that when the, when the creation has started using it. So now all of a sudden it's a bad analogy when before it was a good analogy. You love that one? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you can just look classification of automobiles and their base they're classified by many different uh, for many different reasons very similar to taxonomy classification systematics look at a a spare tire or a jack that you would need for the spare tire the evolutionists would look at that as junk or an evolutionary leftover maybe it's a vestigial uh, structure from when that vehicle had five tires, you know, now it only has four. But really, we understand that it's good design. That's there for a purpose. Engineers put that spare tire there. They put that jack there. Yeah, it's not being used. The evolution is going to assume that it's vestigial. Or maybe they'll assume that the jack, which is buried deep within the trunk of the car, is an atavism. But guess what? You get a flat tire, you're going to need that. And it's forward thinking. It's good design. It's functional. And so there is an analogy to be made. It's not a false analogy because, again, we could look to just those two things or even a cup holder and we can say, hey, this is analogous to your argument from vestigial structure and atavism. But we would argue that those aren't actually vestigial, just like the hind limbs. They're there for a functional reason. They're there for a functional purpose. And... Uh, then the evolutionists, what are your thoughts on this when they say, well, vestigial doesn't mean useless. It can mean that it's just got a new function. It's, it's function's been repurposed. Isn't this just kind of a rescue device? They're accommodating any data within their model because oh, it's they not falsifiable that. at the end of the day. Go ahead. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? Of course, they've always done that. They, they, they change the definition all the time. Think about homology in itself. Matter of fact, here. I will share my screen. Um, I like doing this one because this just directly goes to show you what they do constantly. Um, here we go. Share. Sorry, wasn't ready. You're good. All right. You guys will recognize this. Similarity due to common design. That's right. This was the original one. This is how it was named. This is the origin of it. And it was a creation of Sir Patrick Owen that came up with this idea. Stolen by Charles Darwin. He used it. He came along and said, ah, uh, they won't. I guess they. no one's going to notice. Just get rid of that design. They're on dissimilarity due to common ancestor. 
and then bingo bango. But in reality, always remember, it's actually similarity due to common design. That was the original basis of it. It just got stolen. They just repurposed it. And the analogy of the cars was an evolutionary one. This is the person who said it. This is his analogy of the cars saying, look, it's undeniable evidence. Matter of fact, descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious when you look at the cars. Now, I'll, I'll, the cars. I'm going to play devil's advocate, Matt. Sure. So let's say someone like Guts of Gibbon were to say, well, that's not the same analogy that you guys are using where you're looking at, hey, modes of transportation, they have all these similarities, these features, these traits in common in the same way that the biological world does. And so common design, right? Um, sedans from North America, sedans from Europe, they have similarities, not because they evolved them from a common Arctic ancestor, but because it's good design. What if they that said, works. well, he's looking to an evolution based analogy saying that, hey, over time, let's say over the past hundred years, cars that look more primitive to today, more technologically advanced, that's an example of how evolution happens over millions of years. Well, like I said, they're just you turning, flip flopping over and using it as evidence for them when it was actually the creationist argument to begin with. So, sure, they can take it and say, ah, yes, it's perfectly in line with what we would expect. No, it's not. It's in line with because you've taken the idea and you've lined it up to pretend it's good information for you. But we all know it's not. That's why you didn't come up with the idea. And it's not we, like those primitive cars to cars today in 2020, 2021, 2022 up to 2024, reproduce, pass on their genes. So why are they using a, a car analogy at all, even if they are trying to make it to a uh, common descent? Because the point is they just don't like car analogies at to all. begin with because cars don't reproduce. But if they can <laughs> use cars as an analogy to say, hey, here's an example of how evolution works, then we have the right to use cars and man-made engineered systems and say, hey, here's how the biological world is designed. Here's how we explain the patterns. Exactly. And it seems pretty obvious. And the reason we use car analogies is because that's what people know today. People know vehicles. It's very simple. It's an analogy, meaning it's very simplistic. It's like complaining that, oh, Jesus said a camel can fit through the eye of a needle. That's such a dumb analogy. Camels can't fit through eyes of needles. Well, guess what? The analogy wasn't for us. It was used in his time when there was an actual place called the eye of a needle where you had to strip everything off of a camel for it to fit through into a cave so it could get water. So the analogy worked perfect because it was for that time frame. Right now, people understand cars, so it's a very simplistic analogy. So notice how much detail they go in and try to make it like, oh, it's so ridiculous. It's like, what are you talking about? It's simple. Just look. Just like what the evolutionary guy himself said. Just look. It's obvious you can see a pattern. Exactly. Well, That's what God created. And uh, Guts at Gibbon in her video, and I'm going to do just a full response to everything she said, rather than just touching on a point here, point there. But they look to how they define transitional forms, you know, using apomorphies and synapomorphies or derived traits, basal traits, and how your intermediate would have traits from the ancestor and the descendant. It's blending those features. It's a mix of those features. And so there's no analogy in the car world for that same thing. Well, you can literally take a single model of, let's say, a Chevy Cruze, and you have a base model, and then you have a higher end model. In your base model, you're going to have a basic backup camera. You're going to have some basic systems that look primitive that are essentially the norm for the Chevy Cruze in previous generations. But now they've advanced to the point where you can get a higher end model and you can get a more sophisticated backup camera system. And so in the same model, you can get what looks like an ancestral trait and a descendant trait, a primitive trait and a more technologically or sophisticated trait in, in the same model of, let's say, the Chevy Cruze. And you can find a, a mixture of, of that kind of thing in all types of vehicles. Whereas vehicles are advancing in some parts, those are becoming more sophisticated, but other parts are not quite advancing yet. And so they look more primitive where they're the norm in previous models. And so the point is we can find analogies, comparisons, and illustrations in every facet of the design world. You can just Google, I did it, I'm gonna make some slides. Are there useless parts in a car? 
And there's article after article, there's Reddit posts of people going all <laughs> through just a great multitude of features of vehicles that are essentially useless. They're not even needed. Why are they there? What's the point of it? We need to get rid of it. That's exactly how the evolutionist looks at these vestigial structures, these atavisms, junk, pseudogenes, ERVs. And this is all consistent with what we're saying, that if God created the biological world and we're created in his image, then we should be able to get a sense for how God designed the biological world based on the way we design things. And we have analogy after analogy that fits, including these examples of transitional forms that someone like Gutzik Gibbon, and I appreciate her interaction because I feel these responses engaging each other, they are a gift to creation science because it helps us improve our model. It helps us build a more sophisticated model because we're not just interested in model deconstruction. We're interested in model construction, model building. So we don't want to just refute evolution. We want to provide a superior model in light of all the data that we're analyzing. Matt, go ahead, brother. No, I'm good. Um, I Those pictures were just old ones uh, from the homology talk that I did. So I just think that our model is down to the point where we're fine tuning analogies now, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like it has nothing to do with like our, our overall model and predictions being made. It's, it's literally just how can we help describe things better to an audience? <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? We That's what well, it's come down to. It's because to 99.9% .9 of people, especially in your everyday life, I think you've had the same experiences. When I talk to people in my everyday life and when I had secular jobs and I would talk to agnostics, you would use analogies. You would point out how ridiculous it is to say that you're related to a banana plant. And to most people, it makes sense. They sit back and they go, okay, yeah. That makes sense. But it's only to your most militant evolutionists, your most militant skeptics, that suddenly they just want to heavily focus or hyper uh, focus on the analogy. We're basically, we're using the analogy to show that, hey, homology, nested hierarchies, transitional forms, they're overall agnostic to the debate. We need to look to those lines of evidence that are discriminatory or can differentiate between the models. And that's why we like genetics. And that's why it's a pleasure to see Dr. Zach Hancock here because he loves genetics as much as we do. And I am currently going through Zach's video that he did with Mr. Anderson and Dr. Dan Stern Cardi. Now it's technical, it's heavy. There's a lot of information there. And so I want to prepare some stuff to respond to that in detail. So we're not going to be responding to that today. Our previous show refuting common descent, we spent nearly the whole time on genetics. If you remember correctly, Matt, we also had about an hour on transitional forms. So this one was specific to whale evolution, to some of the aspects of common descent, but also radiometric dating, which you spent a great deal of time on, Matt. And so what would you argue when it comes to the universal versus separate ancestry models, right? Matt, what are some of the best ways to differentiate between the models? What are some of the most powerful arguments and pieces of evidence that suggest separate ancestry over universal common descent? I guess, uh, well, I like predictions, honestly. I, I would always say just go down and do the head to -head, head comparison on what was predicted first and then what we found. It's it's strikingly different. What's ironic too is you literally if uh, you could pick evolution, you can look at it and say, what was the prediction made and not know anything about if a young earth creationist made a prediction on it and just predict the exact opposite is true and you'll be right. <laughs> That's what's amazing about it all. It's so funny. Uh, you can go back and say a uh, single flood bottleneck would allow a rapid expansion and growth of a population from a single pair of ancestors, which evolution would say, no way, the inbreeding would kill them. It would eradicate them. Uh, they, they couldn't even survive because they would just immediately be inbred and die out. But we would predict the exact opposite because of Noah's flood, and we did. And lo and behold, you go into the uh, studies where they drop a couple of mouflon sheep, just two of them off on the islands, and bam, 
they are 700 in a population size within just a few generations later. And there is no problem. There's no inbreeding issues at whatsoever. They stabilize in a population and they, and they have no inbreeding effects whatsoever. And that's exactly what we would expect from Noah's flood, showing animals getting off the ark and inbreeding. So again, we can use the scriptures to base ourselves off of what we, we expect to find with a model and bam, so easy, so easy. And we just keep doing that with different things. And lo and behold, things land on the time frame of the biblical young earth creation model as well, which is even more evidence, so to speak. So why, why would everything keep landing on this? They just, uh, you know, they don't, they don't really consider that. They don't notice how everything just keeps falling in our plate. You know, yeah, young earth creation would be so easy to refute because it would have no evidence behind it whatsoever. It would just have been dead so long ago, but yet the more we find, the more our model grows in strength and the better it gets and the more young earth creationists there are and the model just grows stronger and stronger. This is why these critics never publish to Answers in Genesis and debate Nathaniel Jensen. That's why they just don't do it. They just complain about him. Oh yeah, this and that. They can easily write and publish it for everyone to see him get smoked, right? But where are they? They just don't well, do to it. To their no credit, way. they probably would do a public debate with them. It's hard to get the big ministries to engage in formal public debate though kind of yeah, us as standing for truth ministries that are doing the debate. but i have a feeling dr hancock would debate dr jensen he's in the chat let's see if we can confirm that i have a feeling he would i can you know i don't want to have a double double standard i prefer formal debates i mean i do open mics i do formal debates if somebody challenges me to a written debate i'm probably not going to do it I'd rather just do face-to-face -face debate interactions this way. And I think that's how a lot of the critics are. Yeah, they don't want to go publish in AIG, but at the same time, they'd probably be willing to do a, a formal debate or a public debate. I found it's the exact opposite. They want to debate in the comments section forever and never go live. We have open mic. Very few ever join. Always the same five people. And right. Now, where's everyone else? And it's probably those same five people that would debate Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. We do have the same five to 10 people that are willing to uh, engage. Yeah, Zach here says same, would enjoy to do a formal debate. You know, both sides can present their evidence. Both sides can rebut their evidence, have some uh, cross-examination. And uh, it allows the audience to objectively decide on, you know, who's who's got the stronger model. And so... Yeah, on w w with your predictions, Matt, what do you think? I, I want to ask this question first, actually. Do you believe, because a lot of evolutionists, they'll say this, brother. They'll say, well, to explain all those species, the millions of species that we have today, and you mentioned this earlier, especially for those that would say, hey, some uh, walking whales off of the ark evolve into... Uh, aquatic whales. The, 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 we wouldn't go that far, of course, but they would argue, well, you believe in hyper evolution. You believe in more evolution than we believe in. Because you have all these species coming about in just a few thousand years rather than millions of years. Do we really believe in hyper evolution? Is that a fair argument to be made, brother? No, because uh, evolution requires uh, beneficial mutations to slowly rise to fixation, fixation through a population, changing things morphologically over slow eons of time you can't rapidly do that so no we are, we say that things phenotypically change rapidly because of recombination and gene conversion and those are the things that are where most mutations especially on chromosome 2 are occurring through epigenetic changes so we can see rapid phenotypic changes within kinds to some degree and then that's pretty much the limit but it's not based on the evolutionary change required because that change does take massive amounts of time for a beneficial mutation to sweep through all the populations of the world to make new species becoming new kinds over time. Right. It's the evolutionary model that explains most or all DNA diversity as what? The result of mutations over time. So, of course, they need millions of years to build up the necessary genetic diversity through mutations for selection to act upon, for recombination and gene conversion to be effective with, for epigenetics to help with change. But we're saying 
that most of that diversity, right, is built in from the start. God creates organisms with internal diversity. And so you could get novel phenotypes. You can get morphological change, not necessarily anatomical change, but morphological change and novel phenotypes simply because that allelic variability was built in at the start. And so it can be expressed and manifested quickly. And so that's not hyperevolution because we're not explaining that change through mutations over time. Right, Matt? Right. So we, the critic wants to probably know then like, well, how many animals were on the ark? What's going on there? Answers in Genesis just gives a broad answer of, well, probably somewhere near the family level. That's, that's true and probably some animals. But what about, let's say bats? How many bats were on the ark? Is there a bat? Is there a single bat kind? Or did a fruit bat get off the ark and then evolve sonar? What? I, I don't think so. That would that would be a whole new feature. Did a sonar bat lose it and then evolve into a fruit bat? Or were there multiple kinds of bats on the ark? Where do we draw the line in that? And that's where genetic win, genetics win. See, that's where we can say, okay, was there a giant sloth on the ark? and a small little cuddly three-toed sloth? Or did somehow a gigantic 6,000 pound sloth slowly or rapidly evolve into a little tiny, tiny, tiny little sloth that lives in a tree? So that's what we want to answer as creationists. And genetics is where we would do that because kind is vague, very similar to how um, species is vague. There's 30 different definitions for the thing, right? Well, kind can be the same way. They want to know specific. Well, why? There's no specific anything. So we have to be, we have to look at the genetics and that's where we can trace individual lines of ancestry back, looking at DNA and see what was on the ark. We might not know what was created because what was created might've been multiple varieties of bats and then only a few survived till the ark. See? It's why I think the more sophisticated and appropriate definition of kind is they belong to the same created kind if they can be traced back to a common ancestor. So right. essentially your definition of kind is groups of organisms that can be traced back to a common ancestor rather than just saying, well, if they can bring forth. If they can bring forth, I think is a way for us to determine what is a kind, but they could change or something could happen in the environment and in genetics where they can no longer bring forth. But if we can trace them back to a common ancestor, then they belong to the same kind. And I believe we have done that with many different creatures, specifically humans. All humans can be traced back to a single ancestor, including extinct human groups like Neanderthals, Floresiensis, Hobbit, who's Hobbit, Naledi, Erectus, so on and so forth. Here's a question, brother, from Dr. Joel Duff. Joel, appreciate you being here. It's great having you on our last open mic. Tons of fun. So he's asking, where did all the variation come from in the human mitochondrial DNA genome, if not mutations? Here's something I'll briefly say, and then Matt, I know you'll have a good answer to this. We like the uni parentally inherited DNA compartments like your mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome because we can have a head-to-head -head battle between the evolutions because we agree since they are paternally and maternally inherited, there's no recombination. I understand Y chromosome at the tips. There might be a little bit. Okay. But for the most part, there's, there's no recombination. It's less messy. It's not scrambled. And so we can agree that the DNA differences in those compartments are due to mutations. And that's why we can have that head-to-head -head battle, that head-to-head -head comparison when it comes to making predictions and putting forth a, a model. But in autosomal nuclear DNA, where you have all of these DNA differences, you have recombination, you have gene conversion, and the creationist explains the majority of autosomal nuclear DNA as being the result of created heterozygosity, the evolutionary community looks to the majority of DNA diversity and autosomal nuclear DNA as being the result of mutations, it, it, it's more difficult to have that head-to-head -head battle. And so where does the variation come from in the human mitochondrial DNA genome? I would argue from mutations. DNA differences in the mtDNA is, is mutations. Matt, what are your thoughts? 
if you disagree, feel free to provide your answer. But what are your thoughts on that, brother? I would have to say that, yeah, we're looking inside uh, the body and we're looking inside the genome to determine what is created and what isn't. Right. So if there was a created base genome, for example, what you're looking at here is the CL1 gene. In most human beings, the vast majority, there's no mutations at all. So you're looking at a pristine, pure region inside the mitochondria that was created and there's no mutations there. So then what happens if we go backwards here? Let me remove something. Bam. There we go. So now when we track backwards in time, and we go to a bottleneck, what do we find? Well, at the very bottom under the gorilla, you're looking at mutations. Mutations are seen anywhere there is not an A and a G compound and a C and a T. So pretty easy to spot. And then at the top are not mutations, but where they're different. So let me explain. If you go backwards in time following human beings, you go to a bottleneck and you find that we're different than gorillas in these regions and chimpanzees as well. Therefore, they have their own independent line of ancestry. Gorillas are different in this in these areas on the top that are not mutations as well. So they also have their independent line of ancestry. It's going back to a bottleneck. So since that bottleneck, they have accrued the minimum amount is 25 mutations. Right down here at the bottom is every a point to every single one of them. But the average is around 80. So that's quite a lot of mutations to occur. So now imagine you go back. Let's just give the evolutionary timeline 200,000 years. Okay, we have anywhere from a minimum of about 25, all the way up to about 80 mutations occurring every 200,000 years. Do that 200,000 years, 200,000 years, 200,000 years. Do that until you get to the split between human and gorilla. Based on how many new mutations are arising, we shouldn't be this similar at all, going back about 10 million years. But yet we are. Well, what is that indicative of? So even going back 200,000 years, and we're only getting 25 mutations to 80 mutations on average, up to 100, you're not going to have much similarity going back 10 million years. But yet we have a lot of similarity and we have a lot of mutations accumulating in the primate line. Therefore, there's not a lot of time passing. It also explains the independent lines of ancestry. So if we wanted to know, um, well, how about Neanderthal? Are they on this side of the bottleneck? Are they before the bottleneck? Did they leave Africa for hundreds of thousands of years, like they said, and then survive the bottleneck independently with humans. And then, then we bred. Well, if so, then we wouldn't have a lot of similarity. And the reason why we wouldn't have a lot of similarity is because they existed on opposite sides of the bottleneck. But yet we have so much similarity that we can count only six mutations. I'm pointing at each one of them. That means they're on this side of the bottleneck with us. They have the same code going into the bottleneck. See what I mean? So they can't be before it because genetic bottlenecks reset genetic diversity. So Neanderthal would have a massive amount of different genetics going beyond that, which would have been reset. And we would now see a totally independent line of Neanderthal being able to be tested, but they have the exact same as the human being. So they're on this side and they have an independent line of ancestry with human beings going to that bottleneck. And that is found by, you can see at the top, you can go to the uh, uh, DNA barcoding database and, and check it out yourself. So that's what's amazing. We're finding independent lines of ancestry between human beings, chimpanzees. There's no convergence going back in time, which was what evolution expected to find. Um, you expected to find it. That's why the evolutionary bottleneck had to be brought into effect anyway. Independent lines of ancestry. And genetics is my favorite because it shows these lines of ancestry and can show us what a kind is. There's lots of different kinds of- uh, That's a good slide right there. You know, yeah. you stay on that slide because, and from my understanding, Guts at Gibbons working on a response, at least is what she said a month or so ago. So I'm working on responding to Guts at Gibbons video. I want to be detailed. She put a lot of work into it. I want to give her the respect of responding. But- maybe about eight months ago. I don't know. Time flies by when you're having so much fun, right? I did. I joined in with Brian from Apologetics 101. I did some comprehensive sentence by sentence responses to Guts at Gibbon on junk DNA and also chromosome two. Those were detailed. I left no stone unturned and she hasn't responded yet. And that's fine. You know, it's hard for even us to respond to everybody. You know, I'm also working through Dr. Zach Hancock's video 
there's only so much time. We've been doing a lot of work on whale evolution, a lot of important topics, which is good. I want to touch on them all. So the Y chromosome. I strongly believe that the critics have not adequately answered the Y chromosome challenge. The last time Mr. Anderson was here and we debated for over an hour, I asked him, I said, are you confident enough to say that, yes, sperm competition and any of these untested hypotheses for Y chromosome dissimilarity, are you confident enough to be dogmatic, to say, yeah, you know what, this does answer the challenge? And he said no, because, again, they are untested. So, for example, this is from 2020. And as far as I know, I try to stay up on this. There hasn't been anything solid yet presented answering this. So they've said with the Y chromosome dissimilarity. So right here, Y chromosomes, human Y chromosome, totally different than the chimpanzee, everything about it. I mean, right off the bat, it's half the size. And heterochromatin, totally different, the gene content, the architecture. When you look at the gorilla, the gorilla and the human Y are more similar to each other. So when you consider overall architecture, size differences, and gene content, human Y and gorilla Y are more similar to each other than chimpanzee is to either the gorilla or human. Chimpanzee is supposed to be our closest cousin. Okay. So the point is incredibly different, highly divergent. How do you explain these massive differences? This actually fits our phylogeny of separate ancestry, brother. Correct me if I'm wrong. We've got human, humans as their own separate kind. They can be traced back to a common ancestor. That's our definition. Chimpanzees and bonobos. Now, one thing that sperm competition, faster mutation rates, faster rates of gene conversion can explain is the minor differences between bonobo and chimpanzee. Because notice this, Matt, because your critics will say, well, bonobos and chimpanzees, you say they're related, but they got some differences. Nowhere near, just have a look at this diagram, nowhere, nowhere near the differences that human and chimpanzees Y or uh, does. Heterochromatin, look at the heterochromatin. Notice how similar chimpanzee and bonobo are when it comes to uh, the gene content, the architecture, the size differences. It's only a little different. So those factors that they want to bring up with the chimpanzee and therefore the bonobos probably, yeah, that can explain how they go back to a common arc archetype, okay? So there's another uh, created kind. Gorilla, I would argue, is its own created kind. And then you have your orangutan species that can be traced back to their own kind. And so right here, you have a nice phylogeny answering the phylogeny challenge where you got humans in their own group, chimpanzees and medobos going to their own group, gorillas and theirs, and then the orangutan species. Or just for those evolutionary paleo anthropologists, orangutan. <laughs> so orangutans go into uh, their own common ancestors. So do you see how this, which is from a conventional paper, this is not creationist, because they believe all of these are related, right? They got a common ancestor for all these primates going back 13 million years ago. Well, they got to explain these massive differences, size differences, chromosomal arrangements. I want to see a sophisticated mathematical model presented that explains these, not untested hypotheses. They admit maybe sperm competition. We think this, we think that, but it needs to be evaluated in subsequent studies. So just pointing out these untested hypotheses from these papers that I've read about, I've known about these for the last three years, three to five years since I've been debating it, there is no sophisticated mathematical model presented for how these changes can take place. And so the most parsimonious answer currently, Matt, is that humans and chimpanzees aren't related because these differences are simply too vast. They're too divergent. And yes, the chimpanzee and bonobo Y chromosomes, there's a little difference, but nothing that we can't explain since the arc 4,500 years ago. And so this matches the phylogeny that you just had on screen, which is a representation of our separate ancestry model. What are your thoughts, brother? Well, it makes sense. I mean, I would like to know too, like, uh, is the did the bonobo come first or did the chimpanzee line? The bonobo came last, right? They came out of the chimpanzee line, right? They're more of a recent ancestor. And 
they have why do they have a larger y chromosome or do they not because it looks like they do in that little picture that's what i'm curious about yeah they have y chromosome so they got chimpanzee and bonobo mm -hmm. going back to a common ancestor two million years ago so that's when they they split off right so there were yeah, so, but... so yeah we would have had an arc archetype 4500 years ago for chimpanzees and bonobos but you're saying what came first, the bonobo or the chimpanzee? Right. Did one branch off of the other? Do um, right. That's the one thing that's cool about genetics. We could run that in the genetic database, line up the chimpanzee and the bonobo, see if they match each other, and go back and converge on. Uh, or is there a convergence rate, or do they go, or is it is there something else beyond them? That's what's pretty cool. Yeah. We did that with human beings and we go, oh, look at that. Neanderthal is right in line with us. There is, it's not on the other side of the bottleneck because we would not match those at all. So pretty cool. Um, we are finally able to identify what a kind actually is. And so when somebody comes along and say, well, which, uh, how about, uh, how many different kinds of uh, sheep are there? Which one was on the ark? We can identify that. We can Actually, Matt, before you go. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, you're gonna hate me, but I just want to address these critics. Yeah, so yeah. Andrew says, let, let, let's interact with this. He says he's laughing. Donnie literally told me that the chromosomes are more than less than 50% similar because one is half the size of the other. Okay, let's go here. How similar when you compare overall architecture, size differences, and gene content? are the chimpanzee and Y chromosome. Firstly, when you look at this chimpanzee and human Y chromosome, those differences, does that look like they're 70% they're the same, Matt? 70% the same? Yeah, what? does that look like they're 70% the same or a little no. bit more than that? What? Right, how could anybody no. look at these two chromosomes and say that they're only 70% the same? This is from Dynamic Evolution of Great Ape Y Chromosomes. This is right from their literature. Notice this, their Y chromosomes differ enormously in size and gene content. 70% the same, you could not say that they differ enormously in size and gene content. We have enormous differences right from their own literature. Notice, I'm not making this stuff up. The chimpanzee Y is only half the size of the human Y. So let's say, Let's say I had two pieces of paper, but assume that they had a bunch of writing on it. Can you see the camera? Yes. So this is half the size of this one. We're not assuming that these came from a common ancestor. We're just looking at differences. If this is half the size of this paper, is it not 50% different? It's half the size. Right. So we're comparing it now gene content, architecture, after understanding that this is half the size of this paper. Now we're gonna look at the gene content and all of that. The point is, it's enormously different. Andrew doesn't like when I say it's 35% or 40% the same, or the same, yeah. And notice they say this, the chimpanzee Y is only half the size of the human Y. The percentage of gene families shared by these two chromosomes that split 6 million years ago is similar to that. Notice this, brother. Shared by human and chicken autosomes that split 310 million years ago. <laughs> chicken. <laughs> yeah, chicken autosomes, of course, but still, it makes the yeah. point. In terms of shared genes and overall architecture, the human Y is more similar to the gorilla Y than to the chimpanzee Y. I've literally had critics over the years. I'm not saying anyone in the chat is right now but they've said I'm misrepresenting them and you know this and that. I mean, this is right from their literature. Right here is a summary of the argument that I make. So point is, these chromosomes are enormously different. Half the size, gene content's different, architecture's different. How do you explain those massive differences? We can easily explain the minor differences between chimp and bonobo, Y chromosomes. We can say that they go back to their own created kind. But to include humans in there, no, we need a, a sophisticated mathematical model for that. Isn't that right, Matt? Well, we, any model should be making predictions on any of these things, right? I mean, they never expected to find it was that at all. I guarantee it. <laughs> well, and remember, the gene content as well is totally different. 
because Dr. Duff, appreciate your comments. He says, my hard drive at home is half the size of my hard drive at work, but my home computer can do 10 times the things because it has more programs and files on it and work computer has unused space. Point is, with the Y chromosomes between humans and chimps, the gene content's totally different. So it's not only just half the size and then all the gene content's the same. I mean, it looks like there's almost no heterochromatin in the chimpanzee Y, but quite a bit in the human Y. So they're going to have to argue that all of that was either gained in the human line or lost in the chimp line. Euchromatin looks different. There's a lot of differences is the point. So anyways, to someone like Andrew, let's see your mathematical model. This is a challenge. This is a preclusionary challenge. And whenever I'm in open mic discussions with these guys and I press them enough to say, are you confident with these untested hypotheses of sperm competition, gene conversion, faster mutation rates? The answer is no. Faster mutation rates isn't going to work. Well, th they would basically have to say the chimpanzee is the odd man out. So all of this is occurring in the chimpanzee line because in the human line, the Y chromosome mutates fast, but yet there's low variation in human male Y chromosomes. Every human male Y chromosome is basically the same. There's a lot of, it's uh, uniform. So they're going to have to say that chimpanzees are the odd man out. So let's see the math. Human and chimpanzees split from their common ancestor, and these changes now take place within that six million year time frame. Show us the details. Show us the, the when, the how, the where, the why, <laughs> the numbers. Mm -hmm. Don't just say sperm competition and think you won. You know, they say we got a heat problem. They got a genetic problem, and I'm interested to see how they engage it. Anyways, Matt, go ahead, brother. I highly doubt they want to speed up the mutation rate in the Y chromosome either. So that would not be a, a very good rescue device considering how fast it is and how many animals are losing the Y chromosome having a shrink. <laughs> there are yeah, some how, animals how without are we one talking that, right? How long before the chimpanzee Y is just totally lost with that fast right. mutation, right? Yeah, exactly. Pretty quick. And not a, and so speeding that up only makes the issues worse for that one. So uh, they'll have to neglect that one just simply out of default. So well, let me let me address this. Another one of my other favorite critics, Lorraine Drasophilia. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Still a long weekend, eh, Matt? It's been a good long weekend. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. So she says, now do the X chromosome. This is why I say it's the differences that make all the difference. The, the X chromosomes, very similar across these species. Guess what? Common design. It's the differences that make all the, it's the massive differences that provide us with what, Matt? The discriminatory evidence. Because the similarities, the evolutionists can explain through descent with modification. Right. These structures were inherited from past common ancestors. They've been modified over time. We would say common design. But it's the differences that make all the differences. Can the evolutionary model accommodate these massive differences, even in similar genetic sequences between humans and chimpanzees, there's differences in the way that they're regulated or expressed. <laughs> so even in the similar sequences, there's differences. Okay, go ahead. He, uh, George Bond just said, did he just use an analogy <laughs> using computers? <laughs> Joel, computers don't reproduce. Well, maybe he does have a computer that reproduces. If so, that's awesome. Then we can really use that analogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, what happens when we do make vehicles? You got this manufacturing company, right? Volkswagen or Hyundai, Honda, whatever. They, they're able to make this prototype, hit a button, and they just replicate. What are the evolutionists going to do now? <laughs> There's your reproduction. There's your reproduction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tesla will be the first to do it for all. Yeah, right. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, what were you finishing mm -hmm. off with there, Matt? Oh, no, no. I just saw that um, comment from uh, uh, George Bond talking about design and computers. It's a good, we can see analogies can be used pretty easily. And I, I think we understood the analogy. See? Right. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to go down a rabbit hole on that one for a 30 Let minutes. Tell you why that and, that. and if you look up the basic definition of an analogy, it's not meant to be all encompassing, right? 
But what I find interesting about our analogy is so far, especially after uh, just getting into Gutsy Gibbons' recent video, I've been doing a, a lot of thinking about what she's saying, put it that way, plus research. And we actually do have analogies to counter what she's saying we don't have analogies for. <laughs> Not that we would need this apples to apples comparison because we're comparing man-made designs to the biological world, which God designed. So if you assume God for a second, well, obviously he's going to design in a more sophisticated manner than we can since we're just catching up. So it isn't going to be apples to apples, but I'm noticing in studying this issue that there are pretty solid analogies, even to her argument from synapomorphies and apomorphies and how we define transitional forms with your ancestor descendant relationship there and traits and so on. So it's a great time to be a biblical creationist, brother. We're coming at three and a half hours. Ooh. I'm pretty gassed out. I've done a ton of study for over the last week on whale evolution. I'm content with that presentation we'll, we'll we'll cut out some of these sections make them their own videos like your section on radiometric dating brother fantastic you did an excellent job you're a radiometric datingologist you got a phd in that topic yes. and we covered i think we covered all our bases three and a half hours have flown by we still got over 100 people in the chat we are simulcasting by the way oh good we should um run the trailer for the new movie you want to wrap it up with, with the with the trailer? The long okay, one, yeah. The long one. Okay, let me get the long one ready. Okay. And as I'm doing so, maybe we can answer some of these questions. So here's one that came in a long time ago. Feel free. Does Matt think all granites are creation weak rocks? I work on a stone yard at Hop, a Roger Hopkins stone yard where he cut granite. And I've asked him, where does granite come from? And he said, I've actually gathered some granite that's perfectly round that must have formed in the ocean. So we don't know exactly how granite's formed because he's worked on his entire life. And matter of fact, he's on um, uh, the History Channel talking about granite. He actually built a small pyramid in Egypt next to the large pyramid to show that it could be done manually without any advanced tools. So he knows about rocks and stones and I've asked them specifically, how did granite form? Like, what is it? And they don't really have a good answer. They're not sure. So did all of it form during creation? Perhaps. Um, I don't know if granite can be um, broken into small enough bits that it would reform as granite. Um, usually when we cut through it and it's just dust on the ground, uh, there you can you're not even supposed to breathe it in really there's so much uh, uh harmful elements besides radioactive elements inside of it but when uh uh george might know um the secular version of how granite would have been formed but as far as i'm concerned i would say the vast majority of it would be i think kent would say all of it was because during the flood it would have just gotten reshuffled around and um if it is forming in massive amounts um, I think we'd be able to see it today and it would be more confirmed, but since we're not watching it form and it's all speculative, then yeah, we're probably going to have to throw most of it on creation week, especially since it's the basement rock that we see. Um, that would, I would say definitely was cre created early on. All right. Very good, Matt. Appreciate it. I'm looking at some of the other questions that came in some genetics related questions. I think we kind of touched on these and covered these anyways in the last 20 minutes. Like for example, Zach asks, how do you determine if they have a common ancestor? I think the Y chromosome is one way mm -hmm. uh, you discussed uh, DNA barcoding. Tyler West has a good question here. This could take us probably 20 minutes to answer. So I'm going to save this one for our next show because I got to be somewhere at 11, which is in 25 minutes. So we're going to wrap this up with our six minute trailer guys this has been fun this has been comprehensive i think our previous one a few weeks ago too matt was about four hours so this is good we want to give our audience a chance to ask their questions we want to interact with you guys and we want to uh, matt and i we want to work hard to answer a lot of these challenges in detail we want to give you a four-dimensional explanations like we did tonight with radiometric dating and also whale evolution Okay. And I welcome any criticism, any challenges. I just want to strengthen my understanding on these topics and work at constructing the best possible young earth creation model. So we're going to wrap it up brother with our second and longer trailer 
to the quest for Noah. God bless. The quest for Noah brings us to the world of genetics. It is in our genetics that we can best answer the question of ancestry. It is our genes, our traits that are inherited sperm and egg. Not a fossil, not geography, but again, genes and traits. We have discovered our last Y chromosomal ancestor, Noah, directly in the genomes of living human beings. The Y chromosome is uniparentally inherited DNA. This means that it is passed down on one side. And in this specific case, the father's line. This means the Y chromosome is paternally inherited. It turns out that we only find one male Y chromosome. Every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical and can be traced back to a single ancestor who is Y chromosome Noah. So let's throw the data up on a probability standpoint and look to see if it fits anything that we know from science. Well, it does. It fits what's called a power law curve with an R square of 0.95, which means 95% of the data points fall along a scientifically predictable slope. And it's not by chance. And when then you join that probability, that observation, it, by the way, it's the probability of that line and the slope existing is like into the quadrillions. When I would testify an expert, all you need to is to hit the 5% level of chance. Well, this thing's way beyond the 5% level, 5 level of chance. It's in the point zero 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 zero. Something's going on with this power law curve, right? What's happening to the lifespans? They're exponentially decreasing. You guys, it's a perfect fit. Found on the East Coast when Europeans arrived, has claimed to have this red record, this wallum olum. What I want our viewers to see is how this record reads. I'm, of course, going to read the English translation of it just to see that this is rather different. So let's start with book one, the opening lines of this red record. So this book begins with, at the beginning, the sea everywhere covered the earth. Above it extended a swirling crowd, cloud, and within it the great spirit moved. Primordial, everlasting, invisible, omnipresent, the great spirit moved. And if you've read the Bible, you might say this sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And indeed, this book, this, this red record, describes a very clear creation account, bringing forth the sky, the earth, the clouds, the heavens, bringing forth the day, the night, the stars, bringing forth all of these to move in harmony. So you have echoes here of Genesis chapter 1. Average age before the flood is 912, according to the Bible. So the short answer, why did they live so long? <clears throat> they had a perfect genetic code. They had a perfect diet. God told them what to eat, fruit, vegetables, and seeds. They had perfect soil and probably covering 90% of the earth. They had increased air pressure. They also had filtered sunlight. It's not just the Bible that teaches that they lived a long time. Many cultures have legends of a golden age. There's historical evidence and there's biblical evidence that man used to live a lot longer. You've said that there, you think there's a good chance there's a person alive today that might live to be a thousand. I think it's possible that we could see really extraordinary lifespans. We could even see people living as long as a thousand years. Did you know there's approximately five or 6,000 years of recorded human history? Writing was invented around 3300 BC, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamia Valley. Today that's Iraq. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist, said it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. Richard Overy wrote in the Times Complete History of the World, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5,500 years ago and the beginning of a written or pictorial history. So let's round it out to 6,000. 6,000 years is not that long. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years? or maybe close to a grandmother. We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. Though the Edomites make appearances throughout several books of the Bible, that archeological proof of something that first appeared in the book of Genesis can be found is pretty astonishing.
All right, Matt, you got me all pumped up now. You got me all pumped up for a workout. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> the music, the flow. Good. We did a lot of sitting, <laughs> not moving. Okay, there we go. So, okay, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Matt, we were ambitious for tonight. And we knew so going in, just like our previous show, which is why we took four hours to get through everything. Geologic column, dating methods, whale evolution, comprehensively addressing some of these issues with the design analogy, answering questions. But we got through it all. We also wanted to showcase and highlight the quest for Noah. So tune in, everybody. Tomorrow premieres at 8 p.m. EST. Let's make sure everybody's there. Let's share it around. This content's important. The quest for Noah, we've discovered them. And we've discovered them through many amazing and incredible lines of scientific disciplines and evidence. So Matt, appreciate this, brother. Very informative. A uh, lot of great information just overall. To the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. Appreciate the support, the questions. Uh, we're going to keep doing these. So another few weeks, we'll get together. Uh, we'll continue addressing Vice Rhino and continue uh, to engage the critic. So, Matt, final words, brother? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you ready to go. Not really. <laughs> okay, man. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Good job, my man. Always a pleasure. We'll be talking behind the scenes. To the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. It's a great time to be a biblical creationist. We love you skeptics and non-skeptics. So, okay. God bless. Standing for Truth is out.